Good morning. Good afternoon, depending on where you are. I am Paula Freire Santoro. I am a professor at the Architecture and Urbanism University at Sao Paulo. I'm the coordinator of, at the university and a researcher in advanced studies in the same university. And we're very happy and very excited to start this seminar, Feminist Urban Struggles, Body and Territory in the Construction of Collective Spaces. I will do an introduction with a few rules. We have some people here on Zoom and some people on YouTube. So if you're on Zoom, please keep your microphones and your cameras off, except for when you are going to give a presentation. We have simultaneous interpretation to Portuguese and to English. So all you need to do is click on the corresponding language at the interpretation button. And if you're on YouTube, you can just access the link in our YouTube for the language that you want. We will have a YouTube English version and a YouTube Portuguese version. Also, if you're presenting or speaking, please speak slowly to contribute with the interpreters. And I would also like to thank the interpreters. And this session is being broadcasted on YouTube and the seminar could only be carried out because it counts on the very important support of the Urban Studies Foundation. So I will read a few rules for the authorization of the use of image and sound of those who are participating in participating in this event on the 6th, 7th and 8th of November. You authorize the Institute of Advanced Studies in the University of Sao Paulo to use your image, sound, and speech in audiovisual products made available in the institutional website for IEA and Lab Cidade and other channels of the university and its partners. And the activity will be broadcasted live via these platforms. So I would now like to introduce Priscila Izar, a co-organizer of the seminar. Good afternoon, Priscila. Good afternoon. Thank you, Paula.
Thank you, Priscilla. Now switching back to Portuguese, I would like to highlight that this seminar is a result of a research process that ever since 2014, we have developed at the Architecture and Urbanism University at the University of Sao Paulo, specifically at Lab Cidades, under the title Cities, Gender, and Intersectionality. And this research line seeks to subsidize critical reflections on the planning of urban territory, introducing concepts, theories, and gendered racialized practice, intersectional practices in the reading analysis and proposals of transformation for the urban territory. This is a great effort for us to think about ways to produce knowledge that are intersectional, decolonial, and this is very important because it is a South-South collaboration effort. We have here universities from Tanzania, South Africa, and Brazil leading this organization. And we're very happy to work in this agenda. I would also like to highlight that there is an ongoing articulation, in my opinion, of women researchers and institutions that inspired the seminar that I would like to mention here researchers that drafted the city gender and intersectionality dossier, like Jenny Leni, Gabriela Pereira, Rosana Tavares, I feel like you're here with us. And an agenda, a research agenda that's recent in terms of the approach of the body territory with the ABC Federal University in the seminar that we held in August named Territories of Gender, Body and Space, organized by Rosa Skatkechis. I hope I mentioned, I, I pronounced that right. And some works with IEA and the University of Sao Paulo, especially with Janine Onuki, Kelly Yopian, Roseli Lopes, the vice coordinator of IAA, Luciana Ichikawa, all of whom inspire this group, which is not an official group at IAA, but which has brought forth these themes. And I would also like to thank people at Cidade Queer, in the name of Elio Rabelo, who has done a series of exchanges with us on these themes. And within FAU USP, we had a seminar in 2019 at SESC, which was organized by some very important people at Lab Cidades, like Marina Harcoch, Leticia Linder Lemos, and other events also coordinated by Larissa Lacerda. I would like to thank, especially today, and it's not by chance that the seminar is happening in this period, November 8th, Maria Harko, who was an important researcher in the lab that uh, dealt with this agenda, died. She was ran over while biking at night. And it's been three years since we have been waiting for the trial of the person who ran her over. And in a way, I see this seminar as a celebration of these themes, as a continuation of her agenda in her name and in the name of so many women who inspired this theme. I would like to thank Lab Cidades for their support, especially the communications team, Clara, the people at IEA who are in the backstage and the interpreters. Yes. Yes, thank you, Professor Paula. Thank you, Professor Paula, Priscilla, and all. Yes, you did pronounce correctly. 
Uh, good day all. My name is Elinora Tambuya. I am a research fellow at the Institute of Human Settlement Studies in Ardhi University. This is in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. It's Eastern Africa. Uh, I have very few uh, thanks and acknowledgements. Uh, first of all, to the IHSS, this institute. Uh, for being the host of the many community outreach research that we have been doing, uh, bridging the university and the communities that we work with, especially the one we are working with, with the uh, feminism issues. And the, yeah. uh, but also I, I would like to mention to appreciate the, uh, the role of the CCI, this is the Center for Community Initiatives in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, as well as the Plan Act in South Africa, which are also organizations working uh, with the universities, uh, linking the university with communities, uh, because it's of utmost importance for the university and for Adi University in particular, which has been um, has been working in aiming with uh, enhanced participation and focusing on co-production of knowledge, working with the community. So as we work through advocacy and making the voices of the women heard more. It's, uh, I would really like to acknowledge these uh, organizations. Uh, also, I would like to introduce, though in absentia, Mrs. Husna Shechonge, who would have been with me here, but it's raining really hard and she couldn't make it. But she's the leader and a member of the Women Federation in the community we are working with. Hopefully, you'll some of you will meet her sometimes later. Uh, so for now, that's as much as I have. Uh, I would now welcome uh, Caroline Luneta, who is a lecturer at the Institute of Housing Studies in Rotterdam, Erasmus University uh, in the Netherlands, who are also co-organizers of this event. Thank you. Um, thank, th thanks so much, Priscilla. Um, am I audible? I'm audible, I assume. Um, yes. So the, the head of School of Architecture and Planning is at, a, is at another workshop, and I therefore extend my uh, a warm welcome, not only from Cubes, 
which is based in the school, but also from the school as a whole. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues in CUBES, in particular, former CUBES director, Professor Sarah Charlton, who is Priscilla's host, as Priscilla already mentioned, um, in CUBES and has been working with Priscilla. Um, CUBES is the Center for Urbanism and Built Environment Studies, um, a formerly recognized research group within the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. Um, the approach of CUBES is engagement and grounded research um, that attributes, uh, contributes to socio-spatial justice, urban resilience, and impactful transformative built environment strategies. Um, whereas our activism and engagement is primarily local, it is enriched by South-South and North-South collaboration. Um, this seminar on feminizing or feminist urban struggles therefore connects with and contributes to CUBES's work in many ways. Um, thematically, urban peripheries is a strong theme in CUBES with collaborative international uh, research in which Pro Professor Zara Charlton and Alice Todas have played a leading role. Um, urban politics, decoloniality, and transformation are themes that CUBES grapples with, um, with an orientation that tries to apply in its real, it, which it tries to apply in its real life engagements with a strong interest in spatiality and, and um, territory. So thanks to Priscilla's work in CUBES, um, CUBES has been able to contribute significantly to um, Habitat International Coalition HICS, Women in Housing in Africa Working Group. And we're grateful that HIC is hosting the third day of the seminar and looking forward very much to the plenary a presentation by the current HIC president, Adriana Allen, um, on that day. Um, we look forward immensely to gaining new insights and learning across cities, regions, and continents and language divides uh, from grassroots participants and from engaged academics. Thank you so much. Joan, are you there? Hi, Paula. Can you hear me? Perfect. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry because I'm outside. I'm on my way to the university, but I just wanted, in the name of the Architecture and Urbanism University of Sao Paulo, to impart our support and acknowledgement for the seminar. And in the name of Paula, I'd like to congratulate all of the organizer. And it's very important internally because of an important partnership with Lava Cidades, which is a part of the advanced studies department and also the internationalization efforts of the university, which uh, focus, focuses on South-South internationalization because of the proximity of the themes that, and realities that are discussed, we have a lot in common. So this is a fundamental theme and it's very important. And it's also a tribute to Marina, as Paula said, it was very important because it was a very hard period for us at FAO. So I just wanted to emphasize our institutional support and wish you all an excellent seminar with our full support. Thank you, Joao. Thank you, Joao. And, and uh, telling you a little bit more about
we have Graça Xavier that couldn't come today. I would like to comment with Priscilla with the previous talk that we had. We in Sao Paulo has some, uh, we have no power and no water because we had a storm here. So with the climate change and privatization of public service are affecting our own seminar. Graça couldn't come. She's from the home uh, movement. It, it, she's very important in this movement uh, for home. And we intend in the event of March uh, that uh, the leaderships ahead will be ahead of that. So I'm not going to skip her uh, presentation. And I'm going to call Stephanie Santos, introduce to you, just say that our ambition to the seminar were, were very small. We uh, intend two days, but we received 181 articles and we transformed in oral presentations and another that are available in the Lapsidad website and another ones in video. And Stephanie sent a, a great video, so invite Stephanie to come here if you like to introduce yourself before your work to open our seminar. So Stephanie, you have the floor. Thank you very much for coming. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm Stephanie Santos. I study masters in Minas Gerais University in Belo Horizonte City. I got my research around gender in hip hop, thinking about the city and as a epistemic production. So I'm going to bring a poetry that I wrote in my master's article. <clears throat> I'm always around the city, from the stone, streets, and synesthesy. The world is different from the beach bridges to here. The light of the room that wakes me up. The world reduces itself. My body is a temple, dance in a movement. Where I live, I'm between the streets, the alleys where something made sense. The bodies conduct uh, as other bodies brought, resonates in movement. There's nothing that wouldn't be aligned. And thinking heads, all of us uh, re remake ourselves. Uh, we are making uh, the Atabak sounds and we seek for our identity. We have rhymes. In between 140 BPM, we reinvent ourselves, what I am, what I choose to be. Self um, <clears throat> recovering, conducting my view, epistemic view. There is nothing in my body that wouldn't be recognition. I recreate another world, the translation of the market body in movement and as epistemic is realigned. There is nothing of that in the alley that brought us. So I reinvent myself between the body that's not realigned. Good event to, to everybody. Thank you, Stephanie. Paula, I don't know if it's your turn. No, just thinking. So let's open the panel now. Before we do that, I would like to say once again that Graça couldn't come. Rusna Sechong from the Tanzania uh, couldn't come, but she's going to receive us there in Petunia. Mabosi <clears throat> from South Africa, uh, from the Acevetone group, which is acting in her neighborhood that's going to receive us, that couldn't uh, come today, but I would like to recognize her work in this project. So thank you, 
Stephanie, for your wonderful presentation. Okay, Paolo, you can open the table, please. Let's open the panel now. Just, um, I'm the moderator. Let's call Kelly. Are you here? Can you make your presentation? I would like you to introduce your, ourselves and you are authorized to share your presentation. One question, good morning. Can I speak in Spanish? Only English and Portuguese because my research was done in Spanish and my presentation in Spanish. So I try to translate Portuguese. I'm sorry, because everything is in Spanish. So good morning. For the ones that are in Brazil, I'm Kelly. I'm postdoctor in the advanced studies in global cities uh, institution. I study gender and city talking about uh, mobility and occupation of public spaces in Mexico City and Sao Paulo. And what I'm going to bring is a piece of my research in which I study uh, improvement neighborhood uh, program that exists in Mexico for almost 10 years. And in, in fact, I brought in one of the sh chapters, this look in the genders, because I think every public policy is not neutral. And this gender look uh, help us to understand better the efficacy and if in fact, this policy can attend the demands of the great part of the population, the women. I'm going to share my screen. Just a moment. Okay, we can see it. Great. So as I mentioned, this is just a little small piece of my doctorship thesis where I have a look of gender. This is a picture that I took in one of the projects that I visit uh, that receive support from Mexico City government. So it's one of the projects that exists. This is in uh, downtown, but the majority of the projects are in the neighborhoods from Mexico City. So what is this program? The acronym is PCMB. All the pictures that I bring are programs that are leaded by women. The director and the representatives are women is a program that I can summarize in four axes, four aspects, which based in the right to the city. So since it first convocatory and it's mentioned that uh, it's the right to the city. It's a concept and a narrative that has an approach uh, by the people that promote this kind of project. And it's composed by the associations that are part of this program. And they use that a lot of times is a program that has as a center the citizen participation and everything is made in a particip participative way since the conception, implementation, accountability, research administration that is public and it's delivery, the founding is delivered to the community and uh, the community has the supervision on that. It's a program that the goal is to promote improvement of the public space 
So it's very flexible in that sense to um, have a lot of intervention in the public space. They can build uh, cultural and community spaces and build uh, urban uh, uh, structures and public ways uh, they can enjoy. So you can make interventions there. And finally, is a program that have to involve the academia directly. So I think it's very interesting how it can influence and support a public policy. So they have a technical assistant as a possibility with a specialist from the Mexican university that helped to make the projects. And why do we have to think in a gender perspective? So it called my attention because we have just a few research on these efforts to try to give this gender view on programs. Just one of the researchers that do that is Ju um, is Juiz Garcia uh, in the Mexico University, but we just have a few universities doing research on that. And so it calls attention because of the representation of women that are going to be beneficiated uh, from this public funding and the execution of the projects. So those are data from 2016. 66% of the ones that promote the projects are women. 62% uh, are in the administration committees. And it's a program that the goal is maybe should be one that promote the gender equality and we don't have that definition so clear yet but what's taken under consideration when you talk about gender equality but in the operation rules public uh, that they mention is to develop a, a process supported by participation with gender uh, equality and the improvements of the public space of the people, the neighborhoods in Mexico City. And recently it has uh, international recognition and has received the award from uh, the BID, the International World Bank, sorry, and it shows uh, the importance of the gender equality. So I would like to mention what called my attention while I'm doing while I was doing my research. I interviewed women that coordinates the project. Is this connection of the neighborhoods uh, um, with the women and vice versa? So this is one of uh, sentences that I collect and she is in the Alcadia neighborhood that it has a high level of uh, criminals there. So I'm going to say something that's very important. Our women uh, build the colony when we arrived there, we are only women. When the men left to work, we uh, went to the water pipe trucks. And it was during the 80s and 90s. Just one minute, okay? And then she's in these pictures and she was one of the managers of a community committee that is around the city and it was created because of the community's necessity to the food right and i think that this slide's very interesting in the sense that we did an interview 
the neighbors, with people that live in those communities, then it, that uh, are in this project. So why, what is the reason <clears throat> of this uh, project? So the major reasons that they built this a project so they have a higher availability of time a higher necessity of safety in the colonies so they are interested in all the aspects uh, regarding the patriarchal um, question issue and one of the important things about the program a lot of women uh, strength uh, had those programs. Anyhow, reinforced the roles in the communities. So, what Lourdes Garcia brings is not so positive for women to be ahead of this, those projects because once again they are doing the government role it is multiplying our work journey. So we have to have a, a work on our houses, our work and in the neighborhood. And we have this paradox, this discussion, and we have the individual um, report of the women. And this is one of the women that says, Yes, the project brought empowerment to the women. It, we are uh, the project is about women, and I joined that because of my daughters. Because I realized that I'm going to stay in this colony, and I have to improve the space for my daughters. And she said that now she started to study law, because from the demands that came from the community, they uh, she wanted to graduate. So we have a paradox, and I think it's because we've a public policies that have women ahead, joined and empowered by that. And the other, in the other hand, is about the issue that maybe women are uh, double their gender role, join the community work. So it's another function, so that's it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the Spanish slides and I'm available for this debate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. So in the beginning, we didn't mention, thank you, Kelly, that was the first one. We have a 10 minutes time limit by presentation. So Antonella, if you can start to share your screen, please, your presentation. So 10 minutes, this session is a little bit shorter. It has five presentation and we have this introduction, but uh, we have another session with eight presentations. So we want to have time to discuss a little bit. Antonella, are you ready? Can you share your presentation? Good morning, guys. I'm going to share my screen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The translation began. I'm going to speak Portuguese, but I'm from Argentina, so I don't have the best Portuguese. It's okay. I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Antonella Mitidieri. I'm uh, uh, studying a doctorship in Toha. I work in the Mar del Plata University. I'm an architect by uh, education and I did a master's in Sao Paulo. And my master's was about planning and management of the territory. And now my research work in the doctorship is about the infrastructure management 
<clears throat> and uh, the bodies and the territories. So I research the gender perspective in which are the perspective that women have mainly in Argentina. That's why I'm bringing that presentation that's called Infrastructure, Body and Territory. What for and with whom do women in popular neighborhoods in Argentina fight? And my objective for this research and in my research is, well, here is a very small piece of my research. And since we're short on time, I decided to fo focus on concepts and not on practices because I'm in the first stage of my PhD research. So I am exploring concepts. And the objective is to question the dynamics and territorialities of the bodies of women in popular neighborhoods who experience infrastructure management processes and also recognize alliances in terms of community access and in the management of infrastructures. And in order to do that, I use a methodology which is feminist ethnog ethnography, which has women's practices in the center of the reflection, the concepts and the categories. And it's very interesting because I work in a research group that is science and technology for popular neighborhoods in the University of Mar del Plata, which is involved with the processes in the territory. And I can say that the territory together with the main references of the management of the infrastructure and the actions to improve the neighborhoods. And that's why I can say that I use this methodology. And in the title of my research or of this presentation, I have this question here. What for, how, and with whom? the women in popular neighborhoods in Argentina fight to understand how these women are fighting to obtain what does not exist in popular neighborhoods, which is usually urban services infrastructure. And how do they fight? They fight with their bodies. So I use these two concepts, which are body, territory, embody infrastructure to understand these processes. And with whom do they fight? It's a question that allows me perhaps to understand that they fight with other people. They don't fight by themselves. They fight with their territories, with their bodies and with their networks, the networks that they build in this process. And this is a very interesting picture because it is a process of construction of a water network in a popular neighborhood in Argentina. And most of the people doing that work are women and some of them, uh, and I have some slides to show this later, but I wanted to mention these concepts that I'm using the body territory, which sets the body as the first territory of fight and the territory as a unity, as a unit of reproduction where we carry out day-to-day -day life. And this concept arises through the fights of women, especially indigenous women who are using their body to defend their territory. Veronica Gago says that it is a powerful idea that has a great creative capacity that puts a stake 
the knowledge of the body in the territory, which creates new forms of organization, sociability, exchange. And Azevedo Chavez emphasizes the cosmopolitical dimension and the resistance dimension of this concept, the resistance of violences that the body suffers because they're also defending the, their territory. So that takes its toll. And she proposes other types of relationships without separating the being, which is the ethos, from its habitat, which is an ethos ecological perspective, this indivisibility between production and reproduction, for example. And the other concept, which is body infrastructure, sets the body as the support, the feminized, feminine bodies actively create the conditions that allow for survival. And infrastructure is an invisible structure for the development of day-to-day -day life. These infrastructures are maintained and managed through effective and material social practices of the body. And that is what Rutsky and Chulov are researching. And this is also a very strong concept, the body infrastructure, which is also political. And it also considers that the infrastructure is a political action. And that's why it's so interesting to have this dialogue between the two concepts. And, okay. And here I bring this sociogram to understand how the actors, which may be the state, research institutes, territory institutes, political organizations in different situations of a process to access a network, like I mentioned, a water network in a popular neighborhood in Argentina, are engaging and making coalitions and alliances to be able to uh, build a network, an infrastructure, for example. And here the women are marked in white dots so we can see how they are doing these coalitions with other actors. Or for example, in this collage that I bring here of a process of infrastructure that begins with the an improvement done in the street and that results in an infrastructure project for the urbanization of the entire neighborhood. And uh, here we have the woman leader who's very happy to show me the newspaper articles bringing this piece of news for the city. And happy about a reality that dignifies Villa Evita. And, and these are some examples to bring these issues into the debate. And I would also like to, to leave as a reflection that understanding the body as an active site where we experience and collapse processes to access infrastructure is what actually matters here in this process because, like I said, it takes its toll. The feminine, the feminized body suffers consequences. Like Kelly was saying, many times we have empowerment for women, but we also have the, the price that's paid for engaging in three different work journeys, taking care of the house, working, and taking care of their community. 
So to conclude, which would be, what would be the provision of infrastructure? I have this triangle here, which is a real triangle where the actors that are participating in the management of infrastructure are the territory, the states, and the institutions. And in the territory, obviously, the relevant actors many times are the women, but what happens when the state is not present or when public policies are not sufficient? This triangle, it's working only at the basis with the territory, the women in coalition with institutions and organizations to create access to infrastructure. But this creates a gap, an infrastructure gap. So that's what I had to say, just an example to see how, to show how access and management of infrastructure is currently working, but it's important to organize the alliances, the articulations in community ask, aspects, like I said, because that's where we start having the feminist powerful bodies as body territories and as body infrastructures. Thank you so much, Antonella. And we are finding a lot of points in common and a very interesting translation these different terminologies in different fields, especially in the African context, will be very interesting to discuss. The next presentation is by Ana Cristina da Silva Moraes. Hello, good morning. I'm just going to share my screen now. Anna Christina, could you please stick to the 10 minutes? I'll let you know when you have two left. Yes, I'll try to not speak too quickly, but to stick to the 10 minutes and then we'll have the discussion. Okay, well, good morning. I'm Anna Christina Moraes. I'm an architect and an urbanist. I also have a master's in urban planning with FAUSP, and I'm also an expert in cities, urban planning, and popular participation with the Cidades Institute in the Federal University of Sao Paulo. And I'm also a person who lives in a periphery. I live in the neighborhood of Capão Redondo, and the work that I'm going to present is part of the my end of course paper at UNIFESP and this work was supervised by Professor Charajun Andre. And I'll talk about it very briefly, but if you wanna read it, it's available at the university website. I live in the neighborhood of Capo Redondo and Capo Redondo is a district in the Southern zone periphery of Sao Paulo. I think the entire area is a hub for community mobilization ever since the 70s. And in the neighborhood where I was born in Jardim, Macedonia, it's not that different. The, in the 80s specifically, which was the golden age of social movements in Brazil, here in Jardim, Macedonia, was also a moment of a lot of mobilization, community organization in the neighborhood with all of the problems that the neighborhood faced at that moment. But my entire life, I always heard that women were fundamental in that process. They were the majority and they were fundamental for the social transformation of the neighborhood and also after that, which, uh, resulted in changes for the entire country. But this left me restless because at the same time that people said that women led the actions, I looked at the, more recently, I, 
I looked at the situation and I saw that the political candidates or even the references, the reference names that everybody remembered from that time to talk about the mobilization of, in the peripheries in Sao Paulo in the 90s, most of them were male. And I wondered, well, what's going on? If everybody says that the people who led the actions at that time were women, but the political can candidates that we have are all men, something is strange about that. And so in my, end of course, paper, my goal was to discuss community mobilization modalities in Jardim Macedonia in the 80s from a female perspective. And I used Silvia Ferisha and Kylie Vanya Brucha. And I looked at the 80s and this process in the neighborhood, trying to unveil the hidden structures of domination and exploration that the women activists at the neighborhood was were submitted to at the time. And as I said, the 80s were an inflection point to Brazilian popular classes with new collective subjects like sadeses. And these subjects came up in political parties and neighborhoods, in unions, and specifically in the neighborhoods, these movements came from the Catholic Church, from neighborhood communities, and also new political parties, here specifically the Workers' Party. So quickly going through a timeline of the 80s, we lived through the transition between the 70s and the 80s, where we had a lot of protests, and we had uh, protests against Kirishi and a context of that was very precarious in the peripheries. And it was very interesting because we had these manifestations that brought together different neighborhoods, but it was a very, it had a lot of capillarity. Each neighborhood had its own community organization and here, at Macedonia, this started in 1981 with priest João, an Irish priest that started opening uh, a, 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 the eyes of the community to politics. And in the beginning of the 80s, without any help from government, or any institution, we have some organized actions that are very interesting. I will not detail them, but the work details them if you want to, to read it. And the, the inhabitants organized a census of the neighborhood to survey the main problems. We also have the distribution of food baskets, the organization, of a community pharmacy. And it's interesting that all of these actions have a very heavy participation by women. And the specificities of the neighborhood at that time created a specific way of doing politics outside of the institutionality and institutional policies, po politics. It's based on the collective needs and day-to-day -day life and led specifically by women. And this I say looking at the Macedonian neighborhood in the 80s, but if we take any popular settlement, we will see women leading the day-to-day -day lives. And further on as a response of the mobilization, we have the first responses from the state. So here at the neighborhood, the mayor started supporting a community greenhouse and training courses for uh, seamstresses and the building of the church. And in 88, we elect Luisa Erundina as the mayor of Sao Paulo with the Workers' Party. 
And in 1989, there is a reorganization of the Archidiocese of Sao Paulo. And these processes also transform the community organization of the neighborhood. So the reorganization of the Archidiocese of Sao Paulo, they, uh, we also have many women religious women who are in the daily lives of the neighborhood and the Catholic Church removes these people, these religious people from the peripheries of Sao Paulo. And with that, we end up having more problems to have political uh, representation because the church was at the time a point that really created political representativity and the election of Luisa Erundina also starts institutionalizing things more, which changed how things were organized. The Luisa Erundina administration was fundamental. It changed the face of the neighborhood. That's where, when we built the square of the neighborhood, when asphalt came to the neighborhood, we also have an organization against the closing of the emergency health unit at the neighborhood. And this opposed a measure of the Erundina administration. And looking at the interviews, the entire work is structured based on the speech of these women who are on a daily basis leading these actions. And it's a consensus in the interviews that women were a majority in the actions. So taking some quotes here, I will read very quick, quickly uh, what Cleosa Garcia said. So I think that women for being more present, perhaps like always, were the ones who felt the pressure of the lack of water, of lack, the lack of schools. So they always mobilized more and they were also more present in the neighborhood by staying at home, some who didn't work or who worked from home. So they were the ones becoming more organized. And that is a consensus. However, men were the ones who came up as potential political candidates. And through the interviews, we we saw that, and this is also very interesting because we have a dialogue with the research presented by my previous panelists, because we have this just opposition between the work in activism, the work at the house, the work outside of the house, and also studies. And here I have a, co a quote that says, my sisters got married and I had to take care of four brothers in my house and I had to take care of the house. And sometimes I spent the entire night on a Friday to see everything clean in the house. And it's interesting that she had four brothers who could study the texts that were going around in the, work, in the workers' party, and they had more time to dedicate to politics and to their intellectuality while she had to clean the house. And there was a clear difficulty in accessing intellectual training and political participation in practice due to the sexual division of labor and of the territories. And this is also reproduced in political alienation. And uh, this needs to be very, and th that's it. I try to be very quick. And if you want to read uh, the full article, it's available online. And the fight of these women is a process that is still ongoing. I think that we're now still dealing with these actions, also in the university. And if we are in university, it's only because of these women who preceded us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna. I'm sorry that I have to cut you off, but uh, it's just so that we can have the discussion. Thank you so much for your research. And now I'd like to introduce 
Thaís Matos Morena and Francisco and Francisca Cavalcanti. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I will share my screen now. Okay. Can you see? Can you see it? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Well, so I'll begin. Bruna could not be here, unfortunately, but I'm representing the both of us. Well, I will present uh, the work entitled Women, Houses and Debt, the Household Improvements as a Target of the Expansion of the Capitalization in Peripheries. I graduated in UFC here in the state of Ceará and Bruno, Bruna is a colleague who is helping me take this research forward. And what is this presentation about? What do I mean when I talk about the expansion of the financialization of the peripheries and how are women involved? to get funding to act with uh, educational policies to solve problem, social problems by the market mechanism. The company uh, was built in 2014, selling rebuilding material, which can capture in the stock marketing. And then it starts to act as a bank of little rebuildings and financing little small offices, borrow uh, having loans for offices uh, to be built around Brazil. So this company, it started because of the lack of public policy to improve homes. And then it starts to face the deficits of the inadequation of homes that we have a lack of 11 millions of homes that are inadequate. So that's why I try to investigate on my, on my article, understanding the founding and the office and how women got in this experience and this credit mechanism in this process. So I interviewed 14 architect architect office and also interview 80 women that uh, have those loans for rebuilding. So two important points that I not demonize the companies. My goal was to understand this new social reform that's a new market of the rebuild, understand the contradiction, the limits and how women are insert in, in the sense. And why women? Because the deficit is about women, uh, black and poor women are the ones that are in the domestic environment and less power of decision under the transformation of their own spaces because of machism and racism. And the black and poor women is the one that have more debt and also they receive the the smallest uh, salary. So we have a lack of policies. They were diagnosed as, uh, because of depression, because of that. And between 2020 and 2022, they had um, debt and uh, were unemployed. So. Uh, explaining the company, uh, they capture five millions of reais, and then they start the loans with twelve thousand reais to the families, and they can pay uh, in thirty parcels uh, with an interest of two point two percent, and they don't need to have the the ownership of the house they don't have to prove that they have formal incomes for example if miss maria got a loan of twelve thousand reais he she's going to pay uh, 30 parcels of uh, 
2,592 reais and the, with the interested rates. So this is going direct to the uh, investors. So it's a clear design of the what, what I what of the corner Veronica Gago is going to define. So here as a part of some in, interviews that I made, and the point that I want to highlight is the majority of the women uh, uh, were housekeepers or uh, housemates. They were in debt. The value of the parcels were between 200 and 600 reais. The ones that uh, paid 600 uh, received minimum wage. The majority of rebuilds were on the finishing of the houses, walls, roof. They had uh, severe problems with infiltration the offices don't solve those kind of problems so they are going to solve that of on by her own four of the eight women that i interviewed that couldn't uh pay the parcels i followed them uh, for one year so I asked how that influenced on their lives and they could not pay it, so they have a higher debt because of the interest. And I asked if they wanted to make a future rebuilding, but sometimes they can't thinking in a long term uh, regarding finances. So they, they want to stay doing that with a uh, charity or with their friends that work with uh, on the buildings. So that's the dynamic. Fabiana couldn't start to pay because he, she had to stop to work. And in a general overview how this business uh, works, that the rebuildings is only for finishing, so it doesn't solve the problem of the uh, habitational deficits. If a family wants to rebuild four rooms, they would stay four years paying that. So they're quick rebuildings, two weeks. They don't have a link with the women, bounding with women they are uh, very quick and uh, very fast and unpersonalized uh, customer services so the women could not keep their payments of the parcels the debt uh, caused uh, anxiety because they couldn't pay it and they don't have any politicization about the spaces that the woman occupy in the society because at the first moment they create a happy perspective that they are going to have like something that only rich people have but uh, they couldn't pay for it and the improvement of the home uh, any public policy thinking on that that we need to think that they are associated to the other aspects of their daily life so uh, the how they raise the children uh, the work, so the rebuilds are associated uh, of regarding everything on the women's life. So why women uh, were got that program? Because they want to improve their homes uh, as uh, rich people's life. And so it's a strategy that the company takes advantage and it includes the consumption issue that Veronica Gago brings. And we have a trend in the lack of the state replacing all the public service by merchandising. The speech of the social problem has a uh, politician speech that uh, transform people in clients it's like a um, 
profit thing. So people are going to stay informal. Informal. So it can uh, it can be a cause of the debts for people. So it's demobilized small initiative of the technical assistant focuses in autonomy and social spatial awareness. So in a general uh, thought, we need to think in a coherent public policy as a technical assistant that we have been talking about for several he years. And here finishing, I got three, three theoreticals that bring the issue of the debt. Veronica Gago is going to say that understand how the debt um, extracts the value of the domestic economy as a mechanism of uh, colonization of reproduction of life. And uh, for perspective, we need to get in touch with whom, women to um, improve the activities of the company and investigate the improvements of the process of the homes that would be an alternative for this dynamic. I think I, I talked very fast, but thank you very much. Thank you, Thais, for your very rich work that brought this financiation and the impact in the women's lives. And we are going to keep going. I'm sorry, uh, I think he, she froze. Leticia, are you here? Yes, I am. So please, you can share your presentation. Thank you. Your speech is freezing a little bit. It... No, I think it's just mine. Uh, could I could be freezing too, but no. Let me share my screen to start. I think that's it. Can you see the presentation? Is everything okay? Thank you very much, Priscilla and Paula. I'm Leticia, I'm a researcher, feminist, and an activist. I talk my background because uh, it's important for you to understand how we conduct the research daily. I'm going to use a PowerPoint in English to make it, but I'm going to make my lecture in Portuguese because I only have 10 minutes to present. So it's important for me to speak my language so I can speak faster. We have the simultaneous uh, translation. So if I talk uh, too fast, you can uh, tell me. Uh, I'm making that because of the time. So my goal is the impact of the pandemic and the participation of women in research territories. It has as authors, the Sandra Mono, Luciana Travassos, and all the ones that are showed in the slides. This research is inserted in a bigger project called the impact of COVID-19 on livelihoods, mobility and accessibility of marginalized groups. And it's part of a PAC project of um, FAPESP in a partnership with Technical University of Du Monde and others. And uh, the goal of this big is project is to explore and compare the impact of the pandemic uh, on the mobility, accessibility, and livelihoods of vulnerability groups in Cape Town, the rural region, and the city of Sao Paulo. And so it's our part. In Brazil, considering the gender issue and the fact that women uh, lived the, the impact of pandemic, in a more deep way because of the gender roles, we solve to have as a goal of analysis in this research, the mobility problems faced 
by women, cis or trans that has some uh, any way to receive income. So we had this cohort of gender in the downtown and uh, zona last region as a methodology of the research and is still uh, happening. So it's a preliminary uh, founding. We are using a methodology based in a survey that were applied by interview uh, in a presential on-site way. And we have a tool called Maptioner, which is a research platform used to qualitative um, research in a qualitative way. For us to can make a good articulation with the women, so we intend to interview, we choose to make a partnership for with uh, popular legal promoters that act since 1981. We wanted to make a partnership and invite that the legal promoters could be interviewers on this project. So we have three now, and those are the activists that articulate with the women and with the customer service that are uh, made by the state. So we can do uh, the interviews, in fact. So it's important to say, because of the articulation with the legal promoters, it comes from an idea to get close to the parental movement and our research that are feminists uh, activists. And that's linked to, to the methodology of the research. And the goal is to construct, to find it, that question of the hegemonic production of knowledge and uh, give visibility to plural knowledge and voices. And to any research, this view, it's this point of lives which is a concept that comes from a researcher called Janara Buqueira, from this point of lives that are on the feminism uh, movements, we can have a view against hegemonic production and think about the impact of pandemic truly in women's lives and their experience by a gender lenses. To that, and with the contact of the popular legal promoters, we validate the contacts with several organizations and they come from livelihood movements. And we talked with the women that were in this moment and organizations that uh, act with LGBTQI+. So we could talk with trans women and organizations or spaces that we have the, uh, they just attend women. So we have the Casa Anastasia and other, other ones and spaces that women daily uh, got through. And that's the strategy that we are using and, uh, Tiradentes neighborhood. As I mentioned, the research is still going on, but we got our first meeting with the legal promoters. So we got this partnership and we insert all of them in the project. We did the training part with all the researchers as myself and the other ones. And we just started in some way the application of the interviews. Until this moment, they were made in a legal center in Sao Paulo, uh, Zona Leste, which is called Casa Anastasia. And it's in Avenida Brigadeiro in da Sao Paulo downtown. I'm showing that because I think that uh, talk about of the first findings that we had to this moment. So the first point 
that we find as uh, important is that from the interviews that we made, we didn't notice big changes on the movement of those women. So we thought that it was because of the vulnerability regarding the current context. And so we analyze um, before, currently, and after. And in fact, we think that they do not uh, maintain the social distance is a survival strategy. So those women, some of them from the one that had access, they need to uh, went out of home to work and have incomes. They did in a formal way, but they need to do that as a survival strategy. Something else which we also found interesting, and we saw this uh, in both locations, is that the questions that we asked related to family members, uh, we questioned if they travel to visit family members or friends or support networks. The, these questions evidence the loneliness experienced by these women and a true dichot dichotomy because when you listen to their stories during the interviews, we see that they were people that due to the sexual division of labor and the gender roles attributed to each individual, but these people who take care of many people throughout their lives, they end up in the end, and we saw this very evident in elderly women and also women in the shelters, they end up alone. So loneliness is something that's very present in people who end up uh, without being taken care of. And also what we realized is that the vulnerability of these women caused the questions related to the use of the internet. And also in online purchases were not compatible with the modes of life of these women, precisely because within that context and before and after the pandemic, they don't have money to do uh, daily purchases. They receive the money and then they make the purchase. It's not a constant rut routine. And the ease of access or access to the internet at all is also not present in the lives of these women. And the use of internet is more for social networks, but when we talk about online purchases, it's extremely distant. So these were the references that we use and our findings, and I'm excited for the debate about this research. Thank you so much, Letitia. I will open uh, the floor for Paula to quickly uh, do an introduction. Well, I was going to ask a question, but I don't know if Graça is here, if she would like to talk to us for about three minutes. Are you there, Graça? I, I think she's not here presently. So I'll ask a question just to start the debate. If you guys wanna ask questions in the chat or on YouTube, we are collecting the questions. But I'll ask a general question, which is related to the, someone who read the work and would like to bring all of the research together. I think that you together show how the fight for infrastructure is related to policies and women's policies and also Thais shows the mercantilization of these new uh, policies, which are partial, which are not only about infrastructure. So I would like you to comment because Kelly mentioned a paradox. And 
it's also a paradox of care, but it's not a paradox in terms of political uh, construction and the autonomy of these women and other consequences of this fight that I wanted to hear you on. And on the other hand, thinking about Thais, when the reform doesn't go through women's networks and it is completely mercantilized, as Tai says, are we perhaps not depolitizing or politizing uh, this autonomy work in the territory, which is uh, differentiated from politics because we are seeing improvements studies in Sao Paulo as national policies, right? So there is a goal of mercantilizing and increasing scale. And a question for Thais, uh, I loved your presentation, congratulations. I did a work with João Chiavoni where we looked at those reforms from a financialization perspective as a way to financialize resources that are currently informal. Uh, financialization in the modes of Fernando Esoto that said, let's regularize this for the entire Latin America and then people can take out loans and this money will be in the bank. So I would like you to uh, comment on this new wave of bankarization. Uh, if you analyzed uh, this with a bias of financialization. Okay, before you start, uh, 10 seconds to tell you that we have 15 more minutes in this section, then we're gonna have a break because we have a long day ahead of us. So if you could uh, be very short in your responses, I apologize, but uh, it's because our agenda is pretty full and it's all happening at the same time, but that's where we're at. Okay, Thais goes first. I'll try to speak quickly, but uh, please cut me off if I'm going on for too long. Thank you uh, for your comments, Paula. And I agree that it is a depolitization of this process and an alienation of women in the transformation process of their own houses. And it, this perspective is very depolitizing and the banking issue yes i addressed that and your article and joan's article were a reference for me but in my dissertation i talked about what i understand as financialization from a marxist perspective and i try to understand the financialization of policies in brazil i went through bolsa familia this entire dynamics until i reached the object of research and women so I went from a very abstract perspective to women's bodies. So I went from the abstract part and reached women and how they deal uh, with the social work. And I used Veronica Gago and Federici. And I also did a, an interpretation of the process of indebtedness. Uh, I think I was very quick, but thank you for your comment, Paula. Kelly, would you like to answer Paula's question? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, okay. I think it dialogues a lot with something that came up in my interviews, which is care as a policy. One of the interviewees said, well, in my region, in my neighborhood, women are only leaders in projects that are connected to caregiving. So they are the managers of community canteens, but they are managers in these spaces because men don't want to do that. 
these are tasks that are connected to reproductive roles and caregiving. So it's as if they're only allowed to be leaders in roles that men don't want to play in the communities. So how empowering is that actually? And because they need to become empowered beyond the reproductive issue, or are they only taking up these spaces because there is a gap and the structure allows them to be leaders? So most of the community cafeterias that were created at the initiative of women in the communities who saw the violation of the right to nutrition are in fact managed by women in all of Mexico City. And how is that empowering or not? Because many of them working in these spaces without getting paid, it's basically being a volunteer. So care as a policy, I, I think that they're not there just because uh, they are actually empowered. Many times it's because these were activities that men didn't want to do. So it's a very complex discussion. And I think this is a theme that I want to go deeper on. And I hope I'm able to do that in my postdoctorate. But when one of my colleagues uh, brought the perspective of the feminist ethnography, I tried to do this ethnography work of going to the field, listening to women's experiences, and a lot was made invisible in this process. So yes, uh, I think uh, it, that's a wonderful reflection for me. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Antonella, would you like to comment? And also, I'd like to say that your work, Antonella, really reminded me of the work that we do in Tanzania with different terminologies. And uh, my colleague, Elianata, said the same thing. It's very similar than what we do in Tanzania. So we will have to translate these terms. So can you please uh, make your final comments? Well, wonderful. I really wanted to look at what you're writing. I want to have access to your research. So if you could send that to me later. But I was just thinking that, uh, well, I asked Kelly for her dissertation because I thought it was very interesting. There's a lot in common. Here in Argentina now, I'm analyzing, and I didn't bring that here to this work, but I'm analyzing a public policy by the name of, well, which is, by the Social Urban Secretariat, and it is dedicated for improvements in the houses of women, which may uh, be useful for Thais because uh, its name is Mi Piesa. It's the Mi Piesa program, and is for the improvement of households, but without creating debt because it is a non-refundable fund. So the money doesn't need to be returned. So this could be interesting for you to look at and because it's a little bit like that. We are talking about uh, debts, uh, financialization, and perhaps the support that we can give women to make improvements in their house without having to give the money back. Uh, the empowerment that we are seeking or that the policy is seeking without creating debt, subsequential debt, because it's terrible for women to have a huge amount of debt and not being able to repay. And not being able to uh, overcome poverty. And I think 
you asked me to talk about um I don't know I didn't I didn't really get your question Antonella if I may I wanted to give uh, an additional two minutes to Anna and Letitia because we also need to give uh, the interpreters a rest so we need to stop in six minutes that's okay I'm sorry so the question, and we will keep on discussing that, the question was if this form of care and struggle is a way of doing politics by women and the meaning of that for the urban production process. And something that uh, we observe in Tanzania, for example, is that women feel extremely tired and and the triple work journey is very tiring, but they want to be in that space and they want to participate. So the meaning of that for, for you, and if that's how you see it as a way of doing politics, uh, I asked this question to Ana Cristina in the context of Capão Redondo and also Letitia in the projects she analyzed. You have two minutes, I'm sorry. Can I answer? Of course. Well, I saw there's a question on YouTube, so I will bring the both questions and I'll answer both. And her question was, I would like to hear more about the research in Jardim Macedonia. What is the current situation of the neighborhood considering the political changes in the period? Well, the first thing is that I think uh, caregiving is politics in the day-to-day -day life. It's a way of doing politics that's not recognized. It's not institutional politics. It's not politics for people who necessarily speak well, but these are the people who are making life actually happen. And uh, I think that it's very invisibilized, but at the same time, it's interesting to see how participation in a social movement will also creates autonomy beyond, uh, beyond generations. So also mentioning the question we have from YouTube, I think there's no right answer that says, oh, the neighborhood is doing well or not. It's very diverse. Older women, uh, most of them have already passed. Some are pretty old living in the neighborhood, but no longer acting politically. And there are people who are in the party, they are uh, supporting candidates for a long time. We have people living in the neighborhood, we have people in the university. Me, for example, I am part of that process. I'm in the university and I am part of feminist collectives. So it's diverse, but it's an autonomy process that is extended into the next generations. Currently, the neighborhood is very consolidated. And I think we, uh, we are a neighborhood that is consolidated, but we are in the periphery of Sao Paulo and we still have a lot of problems like violence and many issues. But I think that uh, talking about the depth, I think this transformation pro process between the 80s and now, uh, all of the transformations that the periphery went through between 2003 and now, and how contradictory this process was to decrease uh, political participation, this day-to-day -day politics that's not uh, in the media, and how this entry of capital and the increased income also uh, reorganizes and transforms the care policies. I think that's it. Okay, uh, I'll be very brief, right, Priscilla? And I would just like to say, I'm sorry, Priscilla, go ahead. No, you go ahead. 
Okay, I'll be very brief. I won't even spend two minutes because I know people need to rest. But I think that thinking about care as politics also brings a dichotomy because on the one hand, we need to recognize care as a way of doing politics. And on the other hand, our insertion as women in the political spaces only through a gear giving perspective also reinforces the sexual division of labor and a continuity of the gender roles that we also want to question. So we are currently experiencing this dichotomy and it's uh, we always need to pay attention to it. And I think it has a lot to do with what the previous pa panelists said. And in our experience, what I have seen under this lens of context is caregiving as a structuring part of the female identity and the exercise of motherhood and a naturality of uh, ending up alone. So women who took on caregiving roles and defined their trajectories, uh, exercising that motherhood, but who end their lives or are getting to the end of their lives, especially in the shelters, uh, residing in those spaces without uh, being offered any care by the people who they took care of their entire lives. So uh, exercising the gender role of care for a long time, but not receiving care when they need it. So I think we see that in other types of research, women who are uh, incarcerated as well. And this was very evident for me in my research. So I think that's it. Guys, thank you so much. I don't know if Paula would like to say anything, but I would like to say that your work and what Leticia just said about the loneliness and what Thais said about the effect of the financialization also brings a very specific and very rich contributions, right? So it's not just case studies illustrating what has been discussed, but uh, a lot of new things in the work that you're doing. And it's so interesting. Paula, unless you interrupt me, I will say that we will have a break uh, which is no longer <laughs> of 30 minutes, but 28 minutes. And we will be back on time here in South Africa at 3.30 and here in Brazil at 10.30. So please close your microphones and we'll be back at 10.30 and we will continue discussing housing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Paula Meth from the University of Sheffield. Um, I work on gender and housing um, in African peripheries, particularly in South Africa and Ethiopia. It was wonderful hearing the um, earlier presentations. Can I just remind, I think everybody's doing this anyway, but just remind everybody who's present um, to keep their cameras and their microphones turned off at all times. And I'm going to ask the speakers to please stick to 10 minutes. I know earlier um, um, everybody was was pretty good at speaking to time, but stick to your, your 10 minutes. I will give you a reminder when it gets to eight minutes that you've just got two minutes left, and then I'll remind you again at, um, at the end. Um, I think the first, uh, I think two of our speakers haven't arrived yet, so we're going to start uh, with Barbara's uh, presentation. She's the second speaker um, on the program. Um, but just to say, I'm really excited. I think there's some really strong connections with the earlier sets of papers, particularly around um, bodies and caring and the sort of urban struggles and politics. This session speaks more directly to housing, but they're really lovely interconnections. Uh, we have a bunch of papers um, focusing on Brazil, but also um, a paper focusing on South Africa, and then also one on migrant uh, women uh, living in the city of London. So Barbara, are you ready to um, start your presentation?
you can start your presentation. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Barbara, we can hear you. Can you share your screen, please? Just one minute. Barbara, do tell us if you need assistance with sharing your screen or your presentation. No, I'm fine. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Barbara. I'm a researcher for Margin Lab in Ufis. I did my uh, presentation of master's called, and my presentation is going to be the, the feminist fight. So this research is a product of my master's article in 2023, the uh, post-graduation program of UF, UFIS, entitled I Exist Because I Resist, and it's the uh, reference of women. It has as a goal to reflect uh, the community which not legitimized according to urban planning and how it express in the territory body uh, convoc convocated by the uh, women in the middle Bauhausen. So this research has as a initial issue this a problem to question this kind of model of the city. And we have this patriarchal model according to the background that we got. And because of that, we are going to see the this city experience is going to have uh, ones that are more, one experience more is important than others. So from the moment that one, women uh, want to find that, we build, um, we make another way of life and a fight to exist. So in my research, I think through this idea that cities are beyond this patriarchal log logistic and four concepts. The territory concept, the body uh, territory and the uh, feminism and community. So when the you, women uh, are aware of that, they start their political uh, demands that uh, make the complaints about the fight that they have. And we talk about bodies and territory, we think about this individual scale and this evaluative um, body as a way of fight. So when we talk about the narratives in a um, in methodology in, uh, that it were used on this research, we have uh, we talked about the experiences and another kinds of truth. So the women are always seen 
how they build the memory, they brought the background in those communities and the narrative brings something that's not can be measured by uh, statistic data. So when we think um, that idea, we have similar stories between those women. So, so we have pathways and memories that are shared by them. Here I'm going to I'm going to work with questions that generate a reflection in the mean about women with a urban occupation that have uh, women under violence and questioning this space that have those women uh, and public policy to fight those violence. So the question that I made those those women that are coordinators activists the ones that under this program what it does the program means to them and to the city so i make a narrative from a moment that i got several meetings during one year to build those narratives and through the, those speeches i can analyze the narratives that's going to be compounded by their speech from the written scenario. So I divide it in three acts. Territory, buried territory as a fight and a, a common construction. Okay. So the territory body as a driven issue is the moment that women realize that's not possible for us to live in the same way. So we need to find another way to build this feminism and uh, make the effort to organize uh, how Mirabal women uh, Build that so from the former coordinator are going to talk about that. So Mirabal comes from this idea to occupy uh, homes uh, to women and have uh, the idea to build a house only for women, inspired uh, on Belo Horizonte case. So many women say that no, women cannot occupy only for them. And the second occupation that were done in Latin America for those women that have this idea and have a politic formation in the daily. So it was made in a daily basis of some women that were uh, fighting for that. So over 100 women joined those, this initiative so we have to think about another uh, existential territory that Gago will bring in her book. So they have to let their confining room to build the other spaces. So uh, they don't want her husband as the owner of the houses. So they build uh, this feminist house and here, Priscilla Valti, one of the first coordinators, talks about the experience of this uh, place uh, to care women and this space that is going to be uh, built as a join of politics and thinking uh, about uh, November uh, 25th. Uh, that was the day of fighting against violence or was the day that the Mirabal sister died. So with thinking about the battlefield from the moment that we got this occupation, the city hall said that this place was not legitimate. Besides, it receives women that were taken because of the city hall. But then they said no we want to close and get that space back and they they uh turn off the power 
the one that protects the women and thinking about this fight uh, it this house uh, exists for seven years so today in brazil we have only 2.7 percent of the municipality with the uh, houses that receive the women and their violence so we have several re restrictions about the time that they can stay there. So we try to le legitimate th that house and say that's a legitimate uh, place. And we talked with Don Dara that lived, lived there and he's going to talk about the Mirabel, 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 Mirabel house and she says that only there she got the right way to recompound her life regarding a bigger system, uh, regarding the patriarchal system and the capitalism. So he, she started a counter part of her life in this Mirabal house. Uh, and then ba Julia. Uh, Barbara, just, just, just one minute left, please, and then conclude. Thank you. So this legitimate work. So to produce a proof, we uh, have to prove that to fight against the city hall. A picture of some activities that we did because of the uh, regarding the importance of speak and uh, thinking of this as a community place and thinking about the family uh, a share care and thinking raising children as a collective work natalia that talks about this common idea how being together because we like and we are together because we have this ideal to build uh, something together and at least thinking about that idea to build a uh, land it's a politics in inference because we we are against to uh, share lands and not against uh, women's violence, we are breaking and making an incoherence. So we will be a feminist that uh, defend the bodies and where these bodies are going to go. So long life to Butterfly, Mirabal's sister that were killed during the dictatorship in the Dominican Republic. And we are here for seven years of resistance where I built my research in this bound of uh, feminist movement. And it's because of the women that house resists. I'm sorry, I made some mistakes because it's online. Obrigado, Barbara, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Just to, announced uh, to everybody and um, our two of our speakers are not able to attend today so uh, Priti Mohandas um, and Bethania are not able to be here so we that gives us a bit more flexibility which is great so we can have a, a richer discussion at the end um, but I want to turn um, straight to um, Mariana Laves uh, for her presentation um, Priscilla, unless you wanted somebody else to um, interject be before then, but otherwise we'll turn to Mariana. And Mariana, again, 10 minutes, please. We're being a little bit flexible with time, but but try try to stick to 10 minutes. Uh, if you can upload your slides, that would be great. Thank you. Good morning. I'm going to share my screen now. Hello, Mariana. I believe that you can see my presentation. We can see yes. it. Good morning, Mariana. Just a moment.
Can you see the menu here? No, I can't see. So good morning, I'm Mariana. I'm graduated in architecture from Sao Paulo University. I work as a territory articulator and now I'm in this uh, master's trajectory in the Bahia's Federal University in Salvador. And I'm very happy to be here in this space. It's a very important meeting with such happy topics. And I'm going to talk about this project that I've been building since last year. And the team is Women, a Territory Brothers, Bodies of Fight and the Right to Fight. So the main questions that I have is about how the politics and the hegemonic projects of intervention, urban intervention, have been reduced and deepening the inequalities of gender, gender and race in the access to and uh, to the city, to the rights to the city. <clears throat> and at the same time, talking about this concept of hegemonic development of this space, we have some collective practices to uh, organize by black women in the front line to find the pos their possibility and the territory and building an, uh, another kind of possibilities of living. And here in downtown Salvador, where the work is located, this uh, racist model, it uh, is in the rest rebuilding place that constantly has uh, violated the black community in downtown that they call rebuilding, revitalization, have been produced this process of segregation from uh, ways to unlegitimize the black community where women and their families, their monoparental are the main affected ones. So initially in this work, I built the availability of access to schools and health units, all of that directly affects the work of domestic chores and caregiving and the work that they have historically. And within this broad and complex area, which is the center of the city of Salvador, the work incides on three regions of the center that have different forms of living, living but they are heavily coordinated in the center of the city and they have common issues here in Salvador and in the three territories, they have a black feminist protagonism that's very important. In the Ladeira da Preguiça and in the traditional fishers community, one of the most important and powerful points of that work is that all of the issues that are mobilized are built based on a collective process in this activism, which is built in the spaces of meeting, conversation rounds, and political and territorial incidents. So the entire methodology of labor is a process that is done together. And I think also in the daily lives, in the political training. And the work is based on these narratives, these experiences of the women who are the protagonists of the movements. They are the reference for my entire research that I write in dialogue with the stories and activities that we share in that space. And I think that this has a political and epistemological meaning because it's based on the narratives of the main activists that we can have other perspectives and break with racist um, narratives that say that there is absence in black territories because they actually 
have caregiving policies and collective urban infrastructures that reproduce the life in the territory and make the city happen on a daily basis. And of course, if we consider the historic abandonment of these territories, but understand that this doesn't mean they don't exist. And uh, I think it was important to bring up some things that come up in the speeches of these women throughout my work. And I think one of the things that are more emphasized during this entire process is the sense of belonging to the territory, this identity, this cultural way of life, which is specific to each territory, the ancestrality of mothers, grandmothers, who have been in these communities for decades, and this relationship between the body and the territory, a body that is indivisible from the territory, from the environment, the fight to defend the right to the city, the right to house, to housing is very much related to the bodies of the women. And here's some quotes like from Fernanda Moscoso that she says, we need to think about the old center as a collective pulse of life that makes the center still stand, even though it has been abandoned. And the fact that there's a lot of predatory tourism in the region here in the community of Gamboa, Anacaminha reference it all around Brazil, a fisher woman that had talks about how if she's removed from her territory, she will die because she sees herself as someone who belongs to the ocean. So this shows the relationship between the body and the territory. And also the Ladeira da Preguiça region, which is a territory that was built by formerly enslaved persons who were fighting for their emancipation and we have a leader that says she's the fifth generation that lives in that region. So I think this brings me to my third point, which is the permanence. The three territories are still being disputed here in Salvador and the fight for permanence and for security and safety in the territory is still very present in Gamboa, in Pelourinho and in Ladeira da Preguiça. And this brings a very important point for this research as an activist research, which is I try to collaborate to strengthen these practices of the fights developed in the territories. So I have been carrying out great partnerships to draft projects and to acquire funding for improvement in the houses and projects to create a generation of income for women in the community, a partnership with the legal consultancy here at the university to guarantee the permanence of these occupations and also interventions in these spaces about the public policies that are being built. And more recently, we had a popular public hearing, which was a landmark with over 300 inhabitants in the old center of studies. And we had representatives from the municipality, from the state in this meeting, and more recently we created a popular center for mediation of territorial conflicts led by Black women and composed by activists and entities from the peripheries and the public defender's office and seeking to create proposals that involve all of these conflicts that the old center has uh, been going through, and this will have important results in the coming months. And I think that's it. I try to be quick, but thank you oh, so much. Brilliant. I, I was about to give you another minute or so, Mariana, to finish off. Um, thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you. Some some really wonderful connections uh, between your paper and Barbara's paper, kind of approaching quite distinct topics, but some really interesting overlaps um, in, in, in the issues that you were raising. And thank you for your good timing. Um, Johanna, <laughs> Johanna, are you ready and available? I think we're going to move to the topic of home-based enterprises now. You're there, brilliant. Hi. 
<laughs> Can you put your um, slides up on the screen and share them? Thank you. Perfect. And if you can set your slides to presentation mode so the slides are bigger. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Great. Sorry, I'll speak Portuguese. I am an architect and an urbanist, graduated in the University of of Spirito Santo, and this is my master's thesis in international cooperation, architecture and sustainable energy with the Federal University of Catalonia. And I'm currently part of, uh, of a migration program and I'm trying to focus on settlements in Latin America, and I'm trying to contribute to the gender issue for the migratory theme as well. And the basis, well, my research is based on these questions, which are, if women represent the huge majority in the informal sector, and why is it that this is excluded from gender sensitive approaches in relation to housing and settlements and what are women's perspectives on the specific spatial implications of having home-based enterprises and why aren't home-based enterprises taken into consideration when designing solutions in shelter and settlement programs for women. And my research was based in Espiritu Santo in two neighboring cities, Vitoria and Vila Velha. And it's, it's focused in two neighborhoods which were formed by social housing programs, República and Jabarte. And I analyzed three housing programs. In Vitoria, we have the Republica neighborhood formed by the Coab social housing program that happened in the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, with the building of about 1,400 housing units for with, with an area of about 50 square meters in uh, plots of land of about 200 square meters and Jabaita, which had its most recent process between 2011 and 2016 with two housing programs, the Nossa Casa program and the Mia Casa Mia Vida program. The origin of the region, which is Terra Vermelha, also happened between the 60s and 70s, but as informal settlements and the Jabaita region has this difference. And as we can see in the beginning of our analysis, we have an insertion of the neighborhood uh, of Republica in the urban area. It's a lot closer to the urban area than Jabaita, which is pretty far from the city of Vila Velha. And the origin of the Jabaita neighborhood, which has these two programs was, well, First, the Jabaita residential from the Nossa Casa program, which was 
were houses that were destined for people who were reallocated of flooding areas and 400 houses located in small plots of land. And the Villa Vale residential from the Mia Casa Mia Vida program are about 1,200 houses in small multifamily buildings. The last one was delivered in 2016. And my methodology was through meetings and interviews with women who live, live in the three neighborhoods and they have home-based enterprises. They're seamstresses, cooks, they have beauty salons and they dedicate themselves to various activities. And my analysis was through the interviews that I had with them, the physical observations of the houses and the environment where they're located, the analysis. I'm sorry, my head is thinking in English because my entire research was done in English, but the floor plan, I, I don't remember how to say that in Portuguese. Yes, the floor plan. And as limitations, I really wanted to know what the inside of the houses looked like. And I thought about using a methodology by the name of Photo Voice, which in addition to doing interviews and talking about their experience, they, I wanted them to take pictures of their day-to-day -day lives inside their homes. But I had as a limitation the technology issue. Not everyone had a phone or a data plan. So to have a more homogeneous analysis, I decided to base myself only on the interviews. And I also lacked time to build a relationship, go inside your homes. Well, my the main things that resulted from this analysis uh, we had a spatial analysis of the houses and also results that are socioeconomic. And I analyzed the typology and the construction systems of the housing programs. And what we see in common is that they are rigid construction systems that favor the construction itself and the standardization, the logistics, but they hinder modification possibilities. As we will see in the future, there was a standardization and even though it meets several needs, they're all the same. And actually something that is missing its space. And this space is a key factor for flexibility, be it internal space in the house or external space so that the house can evolve somehow. And in these three programs, even though they were from different times, they're different programs and they're two typologies, we can observe that we have buildings and houses, but basically the same floor plan, a, a bedroom, two bathrooms, a kitchen, and a living room. And something that I observed is that the houses that were uh, in a bigger plot of land, the houses could be adapted and improved, but Unfortunately, in the buildings, that is not possible. And uh, as we see in the previous picture, the women that didn't have that space in their house, they would have to go to the street to develop the economic activities. Because sometimes they start the activities at home and when they can continue in their home, they have to go move to the street due to different reasons. Another significant difference was that in the neighborhood of Republica, we have a much older housing program and we can see that the houses have evolved. And in relation to Jabal Eté, 
which is an earlier program, we still don't have a lot of evolution in the houses and also a difference in the quality of the house itself and that this impacts directly the business that these women conduct. So in these conversations, my presentation was focused and based on the dialogue with the women. And I have some quotes here. And um, some of the questions... Johanna, sorry to interrupt you. Just about a minute, a minute and a bit left to go. Thank you. It's a, the fact that they can't seem to keep the house organized. There's a conflict between activities and this sometimes hinders their business because, and, and it affects the perception of the customers in relation to their ability to produce and to grow their business because they don't have space and this creates a lot of conflicts. And this creates a lot of conflicts with family members and this can increase the vulnerability of these women to gender violence and they need to have a working routine that is adapted to the lack of space and they do that the best way that they can and some other socioeconomic issues these women choose to work from home because it's an alternative to difficulties they face in being in the informal work market and working from home and having a domestic enterprise or a home-based enterprise, they prefer to do that because it's more flexible, because they have health conditions, they have both physical and mental health conditions and uh, age co related issues that hinder them from entering the formal labor market. And the main reason is uh, conciliating the income generation activities and the caregiving activities with the family members. They think this brings them economic independence, more flexibility and accessibility, and, uh, and also more security because sometimes they're exposed to sell their products to insecurity because of mobility issues and violence issues in the city. And like I said, something that was very interesting is that um, the home-based enterprises are sometimes not uh, considered in settlement programs, but they are associated to informality and there's a an avoidance. These people avoid informality as if it was something that should just be eradicated, but these women uh, they recognize the problems of informality and the use of the house is an additional step towards form formalizing their businesses because it allows women to avoid the problems that they have when they open their businesses and cut costs and cut costs like costs with rent, having Your to honey. access, take out loans. Sorry, Johanna, can you conclude now, please? Thank you. Hmm. So in conclusion, the lack of appropriate space in the houses so that they can develop their productive activities, they it creates conflict, it can increase the vulnerability of these women, and they are a a hindrance for the growing of their businesses. And they usually try to do some adaptations, but the type of house that is delivered, which is not flexible, hinders these improvements or modifications. And um, domestic enterprises can be used and as a step towards uh, formalizing the business because it's a possible option for women. And to conclude, in spite of the home-based enterprises have
have a lot of potential in empowering women and so that they can build resilience economically and to decrease their own vulnerabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johanna. Really, um, really interesting how your paper is a bit different to the first two, but drawing some really interesting connections around economic vulnerability, which links very nicely to some of the points Mariana was making, but on a very different scale. Um, and I found your kind of your analysis of the home space really interesting. We're going to move now to the final paper for this session. Uh, we've got Rachel uh, presenting. Um, I know you were having some internet problems earlier. I hope they are resolved. Um, great, I could see Rachel's sharing her, her slides. Um, so again, uh, Rachel, and I, I don't know if Leslie's um, presenting with you, but Rachel, have you got um, your microphone on yet? I can't see you yet. I can, I can't see you, but I can, we can hear you. That's perfect. Thank you. I can see you. Okay. We can hear you, so we can start. You can start. Because... I don't know if she got internet today, but the goal of this research is part of one of the study cases of the leisure research. We're still working to uh, do the theoretical review about the issues uh, regarding feminism in the peripheric territory. So she de developed this study case from he, her own experience as technical assistant, along with this uh, group of people, Caboclos from Rio de Janeiro City. And we have some issues. We, it uh, makes me makes me wonder if you can debate after the presentation what means to us as architects deal with the gender issue in the peripheral uh, territories how it it is marking our action and discuss uh, the body territory issue how it influences as professional our work. And we can uh, talk about, uh, about this theme in our uh, environment from the spatial change transformation issue. I work autonomy, emancipation and some authors that we maybe know and uh, the main basis is to try to see if in those work, these resistances and fights, if these three concepts uh, shows as it is. So I'm, go I'm going to try to answer at the end and let you also explore this theme. So this concept, context, is a part of uh, assistant technical consultancy and was a project of uh, home improvement in three houses in this Campo Grande neighborhood. 
And in fact, it's important to remind this Kaboko neighborhood was a five project of those one, women to the ownership of that area. And it, this uh, biggest collective exists since 2014. It's a women's organization against the patriarchate fight in its majority black women and those that issue appeared in another speeches today the difficulty the particip participative planning and its culture very strong in this collective in the case of technical assistance itself we have a practice around those women that are polit uh, organizing po politics. And in the last two months, their uh, activist actuation in the territory, when uh, they got a manifestation because of that, and uh, what we call as uh, home improvement. So we have pictures of some of the places, mainly in the Caboclos collectives, that was this specific work that I'm uh, monitoring. So this is Zona West Place neighborhood, more informal. We have uh, several houses there uh that uh, we got from the women that were interviewed and some of the speeches that show which is the fight and how they are engaged on this fight we have a perspective to debate uh, the model of the development of the capital and the uh, territorial inequality, the invisibility of the housework, uh, particularly according black women. And in the case uh, of this speech of uh, Guaraci, daughter of Miss Serena, says that the background of the community has in its front line several women that fought because of the right of the, uh, their homes. So it's a strong reference of uh, occupation. They remain in that place. They had uh, here a network that's very big uh, and mainly in the domestic violence. And they are fighting uh, because of have some dignity in the uh, home improvement. So this work had some um, stages of uh, participative planning that were a very important stage where the women uh, didn't want to have men in this work. So they had a lot of training. Uh, we can see in the picture some of the training that they have workshops. And uh, some of the concepts give to this, those women a lot of autonomy. So uh, the workplace was a place where they could be safe and they have another rhythm of work, they have children around, and the children understood that that, that was the moment of the, their mothers to work and uh, join the workshops, which give uh, an emancipation in the sense that they do not depend. Autonomy and emancipation are uh, concepts that are bounded. So they learn about uh, construction concept. So in those in that picture, we see the contact of that wing with uh, this kind of work, the uh, the kitchen, the 
nature they are always doing things in a community way uh, of exchange so we can see after three years that there is a transformation of those women women and the ones that come to join that work and they at some moment they say ah we don't want this uh, assistance anymore because we consider that we are well we can go on by ourselves and we consider that as an important point so this work we reveal our practice itself as practice as a practice that transform and give emancipation and autonomy so it's a transformative experience not only for women architects but the peripheral women it's a epistemologic change against races and uh this construction uh project to review our the practice itself so we have a fight uh, for uh, concrete demands it's not uh, so abstract and we have as a concrete ways we have meetings and a feminist fight which is very strong and some of the issues that to understood what is anti-racist urbanism and feminist that would be to understand the relationship, the dialogical relationship that we need to do between the professional and the per peripheral feminism. So Rachel, we learn Rachel, all the time. Rachel, just one one minute left, please, to conclude. So the learning to understand that we are not going to act with peripheral population without they could be autonomous and decide when and why they could be uh, their own alive. And the comprehension that the anti-racism need to be incorporated to these practices. And that's the references. Thank you very much, very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Again, another um, fascinating presentation. I really love the connections between these four papers. And maybe maybe we've been lucky that we've had four really strong papers that are quite individual and quite distinct from each other, but have actually drawn on some connections. So these questions of construction, I think, you know, that you raise, uh, Rachel, in your paper and, and um, women's agency in relation to construction, it contrasts very nicely with what Johanna was talking about in relation to these um, large state provided inflexible housing um, um, programs. So really interesting overlaps between the papers. Can I um, continue to encourage uh, our audience to think about questions for our speakers? We've had four very stimulating papers. I know there are some questions um, in the chat. So can I invite, yeah, thank you, Barbara, I was gonna say, can I invite all of the speakers to put their video cameras back on? But perhaps to keep your uh, your audio off until until you're speaking, and to have a look um, in the chat, there are a number of questions. Priscilla is going to help me when the questions are in uh, Portuguese or Spanish, um, because my language skills are limited. Um, I'm going to turn first. I think just to I'm going to use my privilege as moderator just to ask a couple of questions and then turn to the um, questions um, in the chat. If there's anybody in the audience who's present with us online, if you want to ask a question, it would be lovely if you ask the question verbally, so you can um, use the raised hand signal and put your microphone on to ask a question. Um, but just, just a quick question for each speaker. Um, so for Barbara, I just wanted um, to know if there were if there were, you, you talked about a very strong collective um, between and a, and a togetherness and a supportiveness uh, between the woman that you were talking about, similar to Rachel. Were there any um, 
was there any evidence of difference or tension between different women um, in the organization or, or, or was it consistently together and supportive? I don't know if that makes um that makes sense. I just I wanted to understand if there were any divisions or tensions um between different women. Um and then um I think uh for Mariana, I was just really interested to know about processes of migration that might have been shaping you talked a lot about race and patriarchy, but I wanted to understand a bit more about processes of migration that were shaping that sense of bodily um um, sort of presence uh, in the spaces that you were describing. So how does migration um, um, sort of influence uh, those experiences? And then Johanna, I was, uh, your, your work is very similar to some of the work I've, I've done. And I was really interested to know if some of your findings about how the home spaces were um, were designed and experiences, did, did you have a, a sense that these may shape the experiences of male um, home-based workers as well. So how, how might it affect men uh, trying to work from home? I think you raised some really interesting gendered uh, um, issues and some specifically for women, but I wanted to know if, 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 if you had any understanding of how it might affect male home-based workers um, as well. Um, and then I think, I think for uh, Rachel, question um to my question for Barbara I think I just wanted to ask about your your, your talk was very um inspiring it was very inspiring and I and I had a sense of really strong committed political networks um and, and I just wanted to ask about the kind of rising individualizing tendencies that we we certainly see here in the UK and I think um in South Africa and elsewhere and whether you are seeing any of these individualizing tendencies shaping some of these strong political networks that you um, uh, were talking about. So those are just some opening opening questions for uh, conversation. And I'm just seeing who else is asked in the chat. I think Rosa had a question as well. Um, Barbara, do you want to start? Because there's a question that was a short question from me, and then there's a question in the chat from Rosa. So if you could take those two questions, that would be great. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, so when I think... Just a question. I don't know if people from uh, YouTube know the question. May I? So when I think in this relationship between women, I think that the biggest challenge that we face, I say we, because when I started to develop my research as Mariana mentioned, I become an activist enjoy the movement and be part of this movement and so every week i was in the house almost every day so i had an immersion in the field and the activist research and i even joined the houses coordination and one of the things that i think it's most difficult is to how to think and have this kind of women that were in their own rooms and think about the socialized measurements. So they show the difficulty to understand the us existence because we understand mine and I issue. And sometimes they do not, oh, they have a hard time to understand how to work collectively. So it's something that they need to learn because they live as a 
community, so we have to share the thing. Women that are not there and also have their own necessities. So it's a community space. So uh, to take care, uh, the housework are shared, the cooking shared. We have a uh, work there when they can have income by that and the women that are taking care of the children while the others are working, they also receive the payments that they got through that. So it's very hard for them to understand these profits uh, sharing because when they don't have a male boss, it's hard to understand that the profit is going to be shared by them. So it's a very interesting situation to talk about because it generates a lot of conflict because they say, oh, I worked eight hours and uh, the other just uh, watched the children for two hours. So this conflict, something that happened. And I think that the movement as Rosa's question, the left movement, I'm uh, vinculated to a party that uh, is re related to socialism. And we are linked to the MEST movement, the self settlement movement, and we built a communi community garden along with MEST and Unidade Popular and my research group. So we have a partnership between several social movements. Uh, we have other organizations, Parceiros Negros, and the women that came from other projects were sheltered in Mirabal. So we got an articulation between the movements and oh, we had a house LGBTQ plus that was taken so we are always articulating between the houses so we are always uh, working with the network even in a support between them and what was the other question i'm trying to remember it was from paula we talk about pana Paula asked for you to talk about if you could identify diversity in this relationship uh, between the women's collectives. I don't know if I'm going to answer it right, but I think that Mirabal currently is an inspiration for other movements around the world. They are suggesting in the Latin America uh, event in 12-11 and in 2016, we have another one in Belo Horizonte State. And currently we have over 10 occupations they are making around the country. So we got this movement to create houses of shelter for women. So it's been, uh, have been expanding around the country and in all the, its regions. So I think that's something that it's, it's possible and it could be an inspiration and the articulation between women uh, uh, around the country. So I think that, I don't know if this is the right answer, but uh, talking about Pana, the several teachers that develop, developed a research project with Quilombolas com communities that came from narratives that uh, to build uh, this PANA project. So from a founding from Canada, we could do this narrative. I can show you. That is uh, represented by uh draws and uh structures but i i had that as a gift 
and it's in my room in my wall. Thank, thank you, Barbara. <laughs> I, I think Barbara um, addressed the question from Rosa um, that was in the chat as well. So thank thank you for answering that. Can we turn to um, Mariana? I know there's well, a I got question, it from... question for Rachel Rantano. as well. Um, Mariana, I, I posed a question for you, but if anybody else has got a question for Mariana, please um, turn your microphone on or, or put a question in the uh, chat as well. Thank you. I would like Paula to repeat the question because I had a problem understanding because of my connection. I would like her to just repeat. Thank you. No, no problem. Mariana, I was just asking if you could tell us a bit more about the, um, the reality of migration and how migration shaped some of the stories and experiences that you were describing in your work. So you were emphasizing race and patriarchy, and you talked about um, histories of slavery as well being very important for some of the embodied kind of attachments to place and and also the 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 threats of of abandonment and and urban violence. I just wondered if you could talk a bit more about how migrate how migration was shaping some of those um, current realities as well. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Well, I don't know exactly what you mean when you say migration, because all of these communities and these women are born in Salvador. There is a migration between neighborhoods, uh, especially when they're younger. I think Sandra, who is the leader in the region of Pelorino at Maki, she talks about this in our encounters when she came with her mother to try and rebuild her life when their parents were going through a divorce and her father uh, kept all of the property that the family had. So there was an internal migration inside the city, but most of the women were born in the territories and they refused to move to other places because that's the, the process of urban planning in the example of Gamboa, there were many proposals to remove the community. It's a fisher community that depends on the ocean to survive. And it's their lifestyle, their identity, their sense of belonging. And there was a, a dynamic of when you have a project for an intervention, you try to remove these families and send them to regions that are far away. And it's not a problem to live away from the center, but the community is built based on the territory. They're connected to that land. And many of the stories that they tell is that some people, when they were removed, they die because they no longer had the network of support. They died of sadness even. So this body, the fish body that Ana Caminha brings, if you take me away from the ocean, this can cause my death. And the, these women are on the other side producing life. And this is something that is very strong about them. They move away from the narrative of violence and they, uh, they bring the power of life and of the other alternatives and possibilities that are systematically denied to them, but that they still try to build in as a community. I don't know if I answered your question, but you 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 answered it. Thank you. It's it's really interesting thinking about the the um, tensions and the challenges between that kind of um, fixed positioning in place where people are being threatened with relocation versus. Uh, some of the challenges that arise when areas um, uh, have distinct and kind of um, significant migratory patterns as well. So I just want, I was just interested to know if because of pressures elsewhere in the region or the country, whether there was also a migrating population coming to the area, threatening or, or causing challenges. Um, but so you, you answered it very clearly. Um, Mariana, there is a question for you uh, from Paula Santoro. Paolo, do you want to ask your question, turning your microphone on? Yes. 
sorry. Uh, I the microphone was not connecting. Hi, Mariana. How are you? Well, I just wanted you to talk a little bit about this idea of the body fish or the fish body and the body territory that reminded me of the connection between body and nature. We are in a decoloniality course at FAO trying to show how this separation between the body and the nature was also a colonial construct and how we can think about this articulation and the rights to the of the river and of the ocean along with our rights and how this also questions uh, this separation that between man and nature and male, men also in the sense of male. So if you could talk about this. Yes, that's very important because it's this construction that separates the human body from other bodies like nature, bodies of water. This is a colonial wide construct. If we hear to the women that have African-based religions and Afro-Brazilian constructions of the reality, it's another understanding of the world that breaks with that relation, that type of relationship, not only in theory, but in practice. If you look at this planning patterns that the city reproduces, it often operates in terms of separation. We are enclosed in a condominium. How do we relate to water, for example? Thinking that many rivers are suppressed by uh, construction. So we have uh, this relationship with water and sometimes with religious uh, sites of African-based territories. And this really brings down this Afro, th this colonial vision. And something that's also very interesting, not only about nature, but thinking about the activism of women. When we, I had a conversation recently where they told me how this political struggle opened space for much more. It opens space for women talking about their sexuality, for identifying as lesbian women, as trans women, to talk about gender-based violence in their homes. So all of it is connected. These violences that are related to nature, the violences in the territory, and the violences suffered by the body. And how this political practice is related to the defense of the ocean and the ways of life, and also the right to live without violence as women. And I remember that, and I think it's very related. Yeah, and I think that's it. Thank you, Mariana. That was really interesting. And I think I think it's so, so fascinating, some of the connections between what you're saying there about the body and separation and the rigidity of, of planning, as well as some of the violence that comes through that. But that links nicely to Johanna, I think, thinking about um, the role of, 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 of planned construction and thinking about how that can lead to separation and um, uh, sort of controlling the way, the way in which space might be used. So, Johanna, um, I just want to encourage the audience, if anyone else has a question for Johanna, please put your microphone on or put a question in the chat. But I asked you the question about um, whether home, whether the design of these houses was also impacting male um, male residents. If you had any comments on that as well, thank you. Well, I don't have a male perspective. My perspective was geared towards women because the motivations are different. Men uh, usually tried homemade enterprises to obtain more income or the motivations are much more uh, economic. For women, it's more about combining the two spheres because currently they are, they provide for families, but they're also caregivers. And the male perspective that I have is about the women, their partners, many of them complain about the mess, that the home-based enterprises bring the lack of privacy because they do interfere with privacy. People uh, calling at the door, customers going into the house. So actually the activities of these women are limited 
by their partners sometimes. Some of them told me I need to work when my husband is not at home because they're upset about it. And, or I have to limit my activities to a specific space. So this is a limiting factor. And we also have extreme cases of domestic violence. A husband was watching television, uh, the woman was sewing, and they got annoyed by the sewing machine and they broke the sewing machine. And the perspective that I have from men is more about the general socioeconomic factors that lead someone to prefer home-based enterprises. But I went deeper into the women's motivations that go beyond that. It's a factor of survival for women, of being able to provide for themselves and for their families, protect themselves from violence. And sometimes they're even exposed to more violence inside the house, when the house is not prepared, and it almost never is to accommodate that type of activity, because unfortunately in our society, it ignores the fact that women work. So when we are having a housing program, even for a settlement, they don't pay attention to that fact. And the case studies that say, oh, we considered this are very rare. And even when we have a survey about this, there's a participatory process that is limited to the activities that are um, more common for houses, which is eating, sleeping, but don't encompass the activities that women carry out. Because in many cases, their lives are in the domestic domain most of the time. Thank you so much. Really, really interesting, uh, really interesting response. And, I, and again, really, you know, important connections with Barbara's work on, on domestic violence, but also thinking about how um, the economic um, kind of feeds through, I think, all the presentations that we've been hearing about and the, the ways in which women's right to the city and capacity to be in the city is so dependent on that economic um, economic independence and economic um, sort of survival. So really, really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, Rachel, you, 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 yes, Johanna? Sure. An interesting fact is that there is a very strong relationship in relation to the quality of the house and the business itself, because the productive activity and the domestic activity are interconnected. So this also reduces, reduces their vulnerability because when they start working from home, they have an economic return and they will invest in the house to improve their own business because the survival comes before the comfort of having an organized house, a clean house. So houses where we have in, in peripheral communities where we have economic activities, we also have an improvement of the house and of the quality of life of the woman and a reduction of their vulnerability in terms of the construction itself. Thank you for, for, for that additional comment. And again, this issue of the body and the significance of the body in shaping um, how housing is experienced, but also as Johanna was describing, how housing can be transformed or invested in or, or adapted uh, you know it, it links very nicely to what Mariana was talking a lot about the body and the, the significance of the body in relation to this idea of um, attachment and belonging um, in these particular spaces um, Rachel there was a question for you from Paula um, Santoro so hopefully she can ask the question herself by turning her um, her voice uh, her camera on I'm just trying to see if there's, I think there's a new question for Barbara in the chat. So we'll come back to you, uh, Barbara, um, in a moment. But Rachel, can I hand over to you to respond to some questions? Thank you. So you had asked about the possible tensions and an increase uh, in individualizing tendencies, right? So I'll answer Paula after that. So about the this tendency, so far we don't see that. On the contrary, 
uh, I think perhaps because the resistance to the entire surrounding, which is very violent, makes them be very united and to have actions like the Solidary Greenhouse or the Solidary Market, weekly meetings where children participate, the lessons participate. So there is a lot of engagement always on concrete issues. Now they're building a small place to be the meeting room for this group. So uh, at least in this small group and in the bigger collective that they're a part of, <laughs> We don't really see that tendency, but there was also an important factor, which were the solidarity networks in during the pandemic and post pandemic as well. So the biggest problem is uh, the struggle against the militias and the patriarchy and the culture of violence in that periphery reminding everyone that the area where we work is in a very remote region away from the center of the city. And it's a very heterogeneous area. I don't know if I answered your question, but we don't really observe that so far. And it's very, very inspiring to hear that. <laughs> um, yeah. I was just there about two months ago and in a very interesting event, they have a farm. So there's a lot of activities, but also a lot of discussions on important issues, especially with younger girls. It's very interesting. Well, how would I define a periphery form of feminism? And I will read the question again and in the chat. So Palo Centuri is I would also like to ask Hakel to compliment on what she considers peripheral feminism. So that is a discussion that comes up in some recent works. And it's, uh, there's a, an interrelation between feminism and periphery. Wouldn't that just be black feminism or popular feminism? But peripheric feminism has its own political identity. It is built uh, when faced with adverse adversity uh, and resistance. And there's something about it, which is the concrete creative action. We have that as a definition of what would be that peripheric feminism. So solidarity networks are very important. We also have a day-to-day -day construction of that notion. So here we also have the definition of the periphery, which would be a periphery as a lifestyle or as a life mode, being someone from the periphery as an identity. And it's very related to uh, a line of thinking where we build on the day-to-day -day your activism. And it is through concrete issues, it's through housing, uh, a healthy diet, for example, which is a theme in these groups that is very important. The healthy diets, organic based diets, the growing herbs also for medicine. When I visited them, I was feeling a bit ill and they gave me some herbs to plant in my house. And there was, a construction of a knowledge that is not, uh, it, it's a bit counter hegemonic in that sense. I don't know, Paula, but it's a discussion. I don't know if I answered your question, but I see it as, well, 
it is related to the territory. I think, yes, because we live in that territory, we fight for it, but it is also a definition of the periphery itself in terms of being peripheric to hegemonic capitalism. But it's an interesting dis discussion, definitely. I don't know if there are any more questions. In Portuguese. Uh, well, wonderful, Raquel. Uh, I wanted to hear from you because I have been uh, a bit bothered with uh, feminist urbanism, which is something that is imported from white European feminism to think about our territories. So since this is a South-South seminar and that in its design tries to look at the periphery as a broader concept of periphery, not only as location, but as a, spa a space for the production of territories, I think your peripheric feminism description was perfect because it allows us to do this, to have this interpretation related to the territory. So it was very good to bring this theme. And I asked you another question, if Paula will allow me to, to ask it. Yes, um, Paula, can can uh, you ask the question quite briefly? Because I want to turn to Johanna as well, who's got a question in the chat. Thank you. Yes, very briefly, when we think about the militia territory and territories that are dominated by criminal groups, drug trafficking and militias, uh, haven't we perhaps erased the interpretation of these occupations in terms of how the female bodies are controlled and how this war on drugs inf influences the people in the territory. Like Johanna has shown, uh, people who are in the territories uh, having their own enterprises and generating income in the best way that they can. So we have perhaps erased this, these processes, don't you think? is an issue that has to be thinking in a wide way and here Janeta just for give an example one of the leaders and people that we need to be aware is hidden because she has been a threat because of the militia she needs to change phone number so it's very complicated so she is still doing her daily life, but she feels threat. The big discussion because of militia does not make the feminist fight viable. The fight for survive to survive because it suffers because we raise communication and the fight itself. I don't know if I, it, ma it makes sense. <clears throat> Thank you, Paolo and Raquel. Um, Johanna, can you see the question from Rosa in the chat? It's a YouTube question. Do you want to address that? If I discuss the entrepreneurship, fem, feminine entrepreneurship. So, Rosa, I'm going to repeat. I would like to know if you, Ohan, I discussed the feminine entrepreneurship it discussed in her article. Yes, I talked about that, but I'm not going deep in the feminine entrepreneurship, but I address that as a way of. Uh, for uh, the women, for the women to be inserted in the uh, labor market. So sometimes they uh, don't have the flexibility and uh, the possibility to earn more. So that's the seed of the feminine entrepreneurship. 
and sometimes it doesn't count with initial foundings and the women have a difficulty to conciliate the home activities or the house activities with the work. So entrepreneurship is this seed. When I said say that it's a step to the formality direction because we you start a small business and then with the incomes that they got, it allows them to growth in the entrepreneurship because sometimes they feel uh, not comfortable comfortable with the fact that they are at their own house doing business so in the future they can leave and grow it makes sense thank you johanna um Thank you. I'll change. When I choose the two study cases, Republica uh, Jabaité, I did this comparison uh, regarding what was done 50 years ago. And I could analyze this house evolution that was 200 square meters, houses one uh, typology, but just occupied 25% of the land. So they evolved. Uh, if they had a structure to attend to a family of two people or seven people. And when you add a layout that there are more activity than the house work, in the women's case, it increases the vulnerability and uh, damage the evolution of the business. Jabaité, that's more uh, recent, many houses uh, had uh, alterations and they adapt the houses to accommodate those uh, uh, their activities. In republics, Coabi, those houses were more developed. And the home government program were, was less developed and uh, sometimes they use the house as a warehouse and uh, make their business on the street 
And many times they created a small shop in their homes and work from there. So sometimes they have to left the house and work closely in, a, in dangerous areas. So they have uh, drug traffic in the area. So when Iman uh, left home to work, we fight to left home, but we can't uh, left home because we have this vulnerability to violence. So you are exposed to the to violence. So Johanna, thank you for your answer. I want to talk with Raquel about this issue that he brought uh, regarding the peripheral feminism and discuss with all of you. Paula made a quest question in the chat box that in the context in South, South Africa and Tanzania, when I talk about uh, peripheral women and they are like, what's that? And uh, that's not right. Uh, peripheral women, peripheral peripheral women we are discussing that and it's a way of life uh, from women that live around the, uh, the the cities and i would like to highlight that it it's not translated because the way as rachel described it's very familiar of the way that women live around here, depending on health, food, not because it's a trend, but because it's a part of their own care to be that way. And I felt in several moments in these moments that the terminology it's not common but the practice practice is and something that we need to take under consideration in those discussions thinking about how can we tailor those practices Thank you, Priscilla. And I really, I really appreciated your observations because they got me thinking about how myself and Sarah Charlton and Alison told us how we've been trying to think about what periphery and peripheralism means in a in an African context. And I think this issue of language is language and narrative is is really interesting across these different geographic spaces. But I, I, it's a bit crazy to finish on such a big question. But maybe if um, Barbara and Mariana and Johanna can just speak for one minute and, uh, you know, this this really useful um, argument that, uh, or discussion that Paula and Raquel were talking about peripheral feminisms, I just wanted them to comment briefly on if this was productive for them theoretically to think about their own work. So Barbara, can we start with you? I think that if nowadays we cannot dissociate in the context where we live in Latin America in the Brazilian context, I think about work that dispute the feminism in this peripheral perspective as Paula mentioned Peripheral is not talk about a peripherism. Mirabal is in a territory that's peripheral regarding the city, but it's not in the neighborhood. So uh, regarding the geographical space, it's not on the neighborhood. 
we got two uh, cases of that. So we can't think how to produce knowledge without the epistemology. Think about in South America that are not associated to the practice in a activist to uh, task to be in the territory and the ones that are in the fields that this knowledge should be built with and not me that uh, got something already ready. And I would, would like to be there to listen and observe and build, then speak. I think that this kind of uh, building of knowledge that all the works presented go through this pathway. And one of the things that I have been thinking, thinking in those territory as education territories beyond this discussion. So that's it. Thank you, Barbara. Now over to Mariana and Johanna for 30 seconds each. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to be very brief. In Salvador cases, uh, the historic downtown, understanding more than a place. So it depends on the ge geographical space. The old downtown, where's the place where it has a, a look. So coming from the women, it's the black feminism, something that they bring in every, in, meeting uh, as black women and looking to the agenda in a different way because we've got some feminism work that separates the dons so they understand the men's so they understand that the men's come along with but in a different way so the black feminism is very powerful and essential in all the systems Thank you, Johanna, in 10 seconds. <laughs> Sorry, the net support networks are very important for they can work giving uh, support and those relations are very important for the metal for the for the women to survive and also that show in the assistance of the government is it correct to replace the support networks or to uh, learn with them because women need to know that uh, they can uh, direct this energy to their own empowerment and build their own resilience and the issue regarding the domestic uh, business the knowledge is uh, done by generations one to another generations so it's a sharing of knowledge and they, they grow together and that's phenomenal. Thank you, Johanna. That's a really lovely, positive way to, to end, end the discussion. Um, thank you for such a rich um, set of papers, really. I know we were pushing you for time, but actually you, you, you've given us a lot. And I, we really appreciate the um, strong connections between the papers. And also, this is such a, a wonderful way to start the workshop with, you know, for the first day. And I'm sure we'll continue these conversations um, tomorrow. So thank you, everybody. Pleasure. I hope I get to meet you in person. <laughs>
Tô sim, professora. Podemos... Ah, mais dois minutos, então, professor. Nenhuma, professora. Parece que tem uma reunião marcada para quarta-feira. Está liberado, professora. Pode. Very well. So, getting back for our first keynote speaker in our event, and we will have other keynote speakers tomorrow and Wednesday. She's very special for us, a representative of voice in Latin America about feminism, political science, and an inspiration for those who think about the transformation of territory and its processes based on a revision of the feminist literature. So our first 
keynote speaker, Veronica Gago. She is a professor in the University of Buenos Aires, the University of San Martin. She's a researcher in the National Council of Technical and Scientific Research, CONIPEC. She's the author of several books. I have many names in Portuguese. It would be the Neolib Neoliberal Reason, Controversy, A Language of Exile. And more recently, she produced a book with Lucy Cavajero about indebtedness. And her academic production is very important. She uh, addresses themes like popular economy, feminist economy, political theory. She has also collaborated in activist research experiences in the Situaciones Collective, the Nino Menos Collective, collectives that uh, combat femicide in Latin America. So Veronica Gago, if you'd like to compliment, a warm welcome to you. And I will try to uh, get your attention when you uh, have reached 30 minutes of your uh, speech. Thank you so much, Paula. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Thank you so much, Raquel Rodnik, for inviting me. And it's an honor to be here uh, participating in these discussions with you. Today, I will be speaking Spanish slowly, and I will talk about a research that we have been doing with Lucy Caballero ever since 2020, the year of the pandemic, but which is connected to researchers we have been doing before and that we are still are engaging in. And our work during the pandemic, we had a point of uh, research that was specific and that seems relevant to bring it here today, considering the theme of this Congress and of this session. Basically, I refer to the idea that entitles the book that we have published, which is The House as a Laboratory for the Capital. And we started discussing how the pandemic has configured uh, a new moment and uh, expanded economic and political logics and also sensitive logics of reorganization of the day-to-day -day life. And we were interested in seeing how the financial sector through policies uh, referred to as financial inclusion policies were proposed as a response to the emergency situation that we had in the locations, in the houses, in the neighborhoods, and in the communities. I'm talking from Argentina, and specifically our research is very focused in Buenos Aires, but I believe that there are several exchanges and points of intersection that I have discussed previously with Paula and Raquel that could uh, be a point of dialogue between different countries in our region. So what I would like to bring forth as a starting point is the acceleration during the pandemic of different tendencies that uh, lead us to formulate this hypothesis that the house became a laboratory for the capital. And this means that the house, the household, was put to the test in terms of new modalities of financial intervention. And it created the intensification of non-remunerated label. So this combination between uh, more intensity uh, in financial dynamics inside the houses and the increase in non-remunerated labor and the links between the two seems key to us because uh, this space that is uh, apparently private, which is the house, in a place that is a lab and that is completely harassed by financial 
dynamics, dyna dynamics of intensification of non-paid labor and in connection to extractive dynamics of the financial capital at the global level. There are several actors, for example, there is a very interesting piece of work by Ryan Massetti that talked about the financialization as a phenomenon that tries to produce uh, uh, territories or enclosures that uh, also focus on the territories that uh, work inside the household as well. And for us, this tendency was intensified during the pandemic. And furthermore, we are interested in signaling how these domestic households stop being enclosed spaces in an emergency situation and became spaces that suffered interventions of financial dynamics. And to go deeper into that hypothesis of the house as a laboratory for the capital, we put at stake the investigation that we had already been doing entitled A Feminist Perspective of Debt, which is a work that we have been carrying out ever since 2017, 2018, which basically meant investigating the place that depth and the undertaking of depth uh, had in the territories and in the reorganization of paid and non-paid labor, and also the way in which uh, undertaking debt as a financial technology was incorporated into social reproduction. In several of our countries, the accumulation of uh, debt in public services and in assistance infrastructure have uh, made the private debt an element or a solution that is necessary to contain uh, vulnerability and to solve day-to-day -day economies. So the increase of poverty allows uh, the undertaking of debt to increase extensively and the acquiring of debt, uh, as we have been investigating in the last years in Argentina, coincides with the with our country had to, having to once again resort to the International Monetary Fund, and is translated into less public resources and the need to acquire domestic that to contain vulnerability and to safeguard one's, oneself from accelerated impoverishment. And so we reached the explanation of how debt in the territories is converted is in, into an obligatory, mandatory, compulsory debt. So understanding how these financial devices are articulated with the reproduction of day-to-day -day life is fundamental because it allows us to understand a capillarization of devices that apparently are abstract and that act at the level of macroeconomics. Uh, and it is fundamental to mark this relationship between the external and public debt and the different financial instruments that that uh, include the depths of governments, but it's clear for us to understand, it's important for us to understand how that public debt has become an element of the indebtment of individuals. So concretely, we studied how people acquire debt to pay for water, uh, electricity, and uh, with Silvia Federici, we did a an intervention, which is also collective and was just published in Brazil that uh, talks about how finances have been converted into a co financial colonization system for social reproduction, how debt was turned into uh, an instrument for the financial colonization in the social reproduction. And this has subjective impacts that are very significant and 
there are several aspects of the feminist theory that are fundamental here when dealing with the dy dynamics of the vulnerability that cause the obligation for debt and the exploration of family bonds and also how that creates an economy an economy of uh, anguish and concern, which are also elements that we work with uh, in terms of the financial exploitation. So this, uh, this displacement that we started to do, which was put depth at the center of the discussion about the social reproduction, stop thinking about depth uh, uh, start thinking about that as a financial colonization instrument and understand the link between non-paid labor and debt and between debt and the impoverishment, impoverishment of our societies. And it's also key for us in epistemo epistemologic terms because it puts at the center domestic debt and therefore domestic territories where that debt is acquired. And this for us has been very important to deal with opening a hypothesis or making way for a broader hypothesis that is related to the pandemic because the pandemic was the scenario where this hypothesis became more clear and more evident, which is that we are before the restructuring of class relationships that have the reproduction environment as the key aspect. And here we need to understand how this financialization of the social reproduction works that reorganizes the dynamics to access public services, the dynamics of paid and non-paid labor, and most of all, this colonizer role of finances at the level of daily life. And here, uh, there's a methodological element that uh, we uh, took from Silvia Federici, which seems very important, which is how do we understand the financiarization as a process that uh, is autonomous and has its own logics and rationality and that tries to capture uh, greed, a political greed that puts certain fights in different cycles and moments of organization. So it doesn't seem to be by chance for us that this invasion of finances into uh, social reproduction is also a response to the feminist fight that has intensified in the last few years and that recognizes caregiving and community-based tasks and the the announcing of the gender pay gap and also how we also want to fight for economic autonomy uh, beyond patriarchal family heterosexual dynamics. It doesn't seem to us to be by chance that the financial dynamics are responding to this desire for autonomy, this desire for the valuing of historically invisibilized labor. And this also allows us to uh, analyze how finan the financial sector captures these uh, social invention dynamics and these political struggle processes that I insist put other logics of value uh, in territories that are historically hyper exploited and hyper invisibilized. And in that sense, uh, we were interested in how the houses or the households themselves were one of the spaces where we can understand perhaps the category of the German feminist Maria Mies, who recently passed. She proposed the category of super exploitation, which means there's a difference between uh, 
the capital, not only uh, appropriating the time and the labor uh, as the classic definition of value, but there are moments and territories where the capital uh, tries to appropriate the time the and the work that are necessary for the production of the livelihoods or for social reproduction, as we call it. Maria Mies works with a perspective that she calls uh, livelihoods, but uh, the time and work necessary for livelihoods for social reproduction is what creates a logic of super exploitation. So when we talk about how we can think during the pandemic about these logics of restructuring of the capital that have the house as a laboratory, we take as a premise this idea of super exploitation, which means that the capital is appropriating the time and the work that is necessary for uh, livelihoods and for social rep reproduction. And this is important and interesting. And uh, we can extend this to what happens in the houses, in the neighborhoods, and in the different domestic territories. And uh, the domestic territories that we analyzed was also in Madrid, and it seems to me that uh, this name of collective ter territories allows us to understand what's domestic as a territory and not only related to the house, but also to the expansion and rearticulation of the house with community territories and neighborhoods, which is, our, is historic in our continent. And it's very visible in the way our urban spaces and suburban spaces are organized and the connections between our urban and suburban spaces with non-urban space. So we supposed that it's a group of uh, positive that include those four places and what allows them to go into the financial technology of those places that made a higher offer of loans and also the, of the gathering of uh, online tickets and uh, different ways to how to pay it. Let's wait a little bit because it froze. So let's wait a little bit. I lost connection one minute. It stopped talking about the places as uh, financial terminals. I didn't know where I was. So this issue of the places as financial uh, terminals because it helps to break this idea as a private space, as a closed space preserved as a uh, financial and this capitalization allow us to think this image uh, as through 
the inclusion of technological uh, finance and the different ways to bankerization and intervention and digital and finance technology that is has been intensi intensifying in our countries during the pandemic times. So for example, in our Argentina, not only in Argentina, we produce inclusion finance inclusion policies when they suspend the places uh, ticket. So after the financial crisis of 2008, it comes back to show as a solution for the poor population that already exist and were included in the financial system through that. And that's another thing because the, the financial, the inclusion financial policies shows including uh, the population that weren't linked in uh, financial dispo disposals. So this one that are going to be included, uh, what we want that they have intimacy with this system. So this uh, as a global policy, what allows and what it demands is to produce to this population, uh, the, they don't have literacy. So in a systemic way, are very strong. So we produce a lot of investigation and uh, prevention as uh, the work of Anis Ferreira Paulo Chacara about the impact that we had in the, uh, because of the crisis of 2008 and uh, the racial population that affect the incomes, so it explains the appropriation of the global capital. So that's the construction of what are the most affected population and epistemically it's fundamental. Lucy Cavagero in this um, work also we got an image produced uh, by the feminists in the 70s, which the hunt to the factory. Another picture, how to think it's not a closed space. It's a space to produce value. It's a discussion that's very important in the 70s, in several perspectives. And when we, respond that the women didn't need to go to the, the factory, just what was interesting in that image to the hunt to the factory is to rethink of how we can reorganize the production environment in those hunts where the difference from the seventh, we can say that's not a hunt, traditional hunt, that uh, a couple of uh, men and women have as uh, how to receive the payment. So nowadays, as we see as an emergency in a way of organization of these factory houses is represented by what's mono parental places, so mothers, and women that combine uh, reproductive work, community work, and the political work organizations. That seems to me that's fundamental if we have this image of um, to the factory and what means to think the houses as factories. Then we come back 
to a notion that's important is to finance capture of those places, of this confirmation of the places. So there, I think that the, the term capture that takes the philosophy that takes the feminist economies, it's on that hand, thinking about how the finances are also a dispute of the subjectivity level, how they work in the microscopical and recreative of our habits to return to something that is precarious. So the uh, finances mechanisms incorporates itself in a micro way uh, as a precarious um, inclusion. So we have a lot of uh, domestic knowledge, financial knowledge of the daily life that are captured by the finances. And it seems to me that coming back to the epistemological beginning uh, behind the finances, of the political civilization, it seems to me that we have to think how this financial colonization of the uh, social reproduction is contesting the unconfining of the places to those patriarchal relationship as a concept of family. So there is a feminist politicization that we have been talking about and the ways of working in the domestic places and the guidelines of the financial and that seems to me that's an important so feminism in its discussion and it's theoretic it's all the time is giving visibility to the places uh, the production of the family the kitchen the rooms the community spaces so the finances are responding with a capitalization of this way to deconfine what we understood as leave. There is a point which is very important is the boundary between the reproductive work and the godness. When the godness uh, demands a higher work and the godness it converts itself in a dynamism of the precarious way overall all the women that should work more to honor their financial obligation and this idea of financial obligation is covered of moral mandates and guilt and responsabilization about who has the care task and what seems to me important is how thank you to a group of debates and uh, feminist fights, we could give the visibility between godness and living and godness and non-paid work. So, regarding this issue is the way that during the pandemic uh, the rent converts you know, a way of have that so in Argentina, that was simultaneous to the debate regarding the law of rent. And thanks to the association of the new uh, 
ten tenants. And so because of that, we've got a new law because of tenants. So we have a permanent provision of uh, debt. So this fight of tenants was important to bring that question. In that sense, I can say that it was an important moment to, because it, it connects itself with pre-existent phenomenon that was mandatory of the places to respond to precarious uh, places. And that converted in an important question during the pandemic time. So the speculation in the Argentina case and dollarization of Argentina introduced inside the places, dynamics of speculations and the finance circuits that were speculating with the about the value of the dollar and refers uh, to the business not, not as a safe place, but connected and invalid because of financial dynamics, dynamics that connected, that were connected. And the tasks of social uh, reproduction were included in those aspects. And another interesting point during the pandemic time, dynamics of taking back the land and the tenants, and all of them showed the impact of uh, uh, that in the social reproduction. and with a uh, specific landmark uh, regarding the genders. So what is interesting to, to me as a point is how this way and this institution of uh, financial dyna dynamics implies uh, in a speculation dynamics uh, that what obligates the speculation in the poor sectors there are parts of this territory that are under the logistics of uh, the the homes as the way of sur survival. Yeah. So we can. We have this thing, speculation around that as points of contact. So when you think uh, uh, the house as a capital lab, so we have this connection between that house and uh, income. So we have to understand how they are, uh, how the women are the one that are more obligated to have the majority of the reproductive work. Why those elements allowed us to understand what's happening in the social reproduction as a strategic field of reconfiguration of this speculative um, rules of the capital and as I mentioned, to understand how this financial dynamic through the debt and technologies uh, regarding the financial and exploring uh, sorority and showing the impact of the finances in the social reproduction. So I want to finish with two questions. On one hand, what is interesting to understand the distinct dynamics about the finance strategy of that, what's happening in several places, what's interesting. Um, and, the, and the last thing, 
what we've been talking with Paula and Raquel to talk about this finance, financial capital as a part of uh, extractive logistics. On one hand, the increase of the rent regarding the salary and also the debt is a way of abstract the value. So the connection of this extractive logistics uh, under the territories and also regarding the way to recognize work that are were not are not recognized as that as work. So the territory are recognized. Uh, regarding politics, I mean, it's this uh, financial colonization in which were more uh, intensified uh, regarding violence. So I can, we can have a little bit, uh, some questions. I will now open the floor for questions. I don't see any in the chat, but I will start by making some provocations that you can comment on. Can you understand my Portugnol? Your Portugnol is perfect. Great. Uh, well, I remembered that one day we had, uh, I was reading the book, um, one of these books here that you wrote, uh, I thought about a question, which is here in Brazil, when we read territory in the 70s until the 2000s, we used the idea of low income urbanism, uh, like peripheries and peripheries is also part of the name of the seminar and that were built with the income of the workers. But when I was reading your books, I thought that we were also talking about an urbanism that was without income, not even low income, without any income. And when I read the book about the house as the laboratory for the capital, I ask, wouldn't it be an adapted urbanism, an uh, urbanism without income and adapted? And just something that we could perhaps think about. And another comment that I wanted to make would be for you to talk about a little bit, a little bit about who is interested in the finance, in the finances or in the bankarization as a way of having access to money in informal markets where the financial market or the more tra traditional market would not have access. And many policies were uh, tested for bankarization and these policies are always renewing themselves because in the previous panel, we were talking about improvements in the neighborhoods that were paid by the debts acquired by the families. And I thought you could perhaps talk a little bit about this. So uh, perhaps uh, I you can start with those two questions. Perfect, Paula. And uh, this idea of indebted urbanism is completely correct. In this book that you mentioned, we worked with colleagues in a settlement in a favela, in a slum here in the city of Buenos Aires. And they're denouncing an urbanization process which is based on debt. So there's a proposal of the issuing of titles for the houses formalized by uh, 
uh, housing projects in the government of the cities, but based on that. And here we have a connection, which is key because it articulates public uh, housing projects in the government of the city of Buenos Aires with the debt of the government and the cities that use these territories as guarantees for taking out loans, for example, with the Inter-American Development Bank and uh, the quote unquote landowners of these house, uh, houses, uh, know that they will never actually own the houses because they only own the debt. And uh, why is it that these houses are a source of debt? So there is a change between self-built houses to houses built by the government, but uh, these houses mean debt and they know that they won't be able to pay for that debt and that the banks that are funding the projects will uh, evict them from the houses. So it's a development based on debt and they, it uses financial devices for eviction. And this probably derives from this idea of urbanism based on debt, but I was talking about the fact that having a house means acquiring debt in order to not be evicted and to pay the landowner. And how this is added to previous debt. So the correct category would be over indebtedness. It's not just one debt. It's over indebtedness and uh, the house here is key to see how we can produce this group of debts. And another issue that I have been studying for a long time is that uh, one which you signal, since in our countries we had a bankarization of social policy, which at the same time that they are, uh, uh, something that provides reliefs to vulnerable populations and populations that have fought for different access, types of access to goods and services. The way to respond to this demand is through banks, major banks, mediate public resources and the demands of these populations. So this bankarization of the impoverished populations has also been great business for banks with the guarantee of the state. And at the same time, uh, it has been a part of the discussion in our countries in terms of including in consumption cycles, populations that were previously excluded. So there is an entire dynamics that's very contradictory and ambivalent in terms of what this bankarization of the populations, the more vulnerable population has created. And I want to mention a data from the current situation in Argentina. The government offers credit to pay for debt. So we make the assumption that the population is over indebted, both popular and medium class. And especially for credit cards that are used to pay for several types of, uh, of expenses. And the right, the money from the state goes directly to the credit card to pay for the debt. So there is a recognition of the level of debt of the population, but what is being offered is more debt. It's cheaper debt because it's funded by the state. So the interest rate is much lower when it, the state is the guarantor and not the banks, but this money also goes to banks. So 
we are at a level of depth and a cycle of depth, which on the one hand, currently we have to measure poverty in our countries. We need to incorporate the indebtedness index because it's not only enough to measure the level of access. We also need to measure the level of depth to complete this definition of what we refer to as poverty. And we see this in Argentina, where we have a record number of poverty in the last 40 years. So I believe that we have a debate between the forms of bankarization and financial inclusion, so to speak, where the state transfers public resources to banks. And at the same time, how can we discuss the origins of this bankarization, which is a very legitimate demand for goods and services in the more vulnerable sectors. Thank you so much. We also have uh, a federal national program here by the name of Desenrola Brasil, which is to uh, get people out of debt and it provides credit and it's the same thing. It's the same cycle which you mentioned. We have three questions and the three of them are related. How can we uh, get people out of debt? The first one is by Kaya Lazzarini. I would like to ask from Veronica, what are the financial disobedience dynamics examples to inspire us. Someone else uh, asks about the feminist movement and the formation of, fem oh, I'll speak in Portuguese, is that okay? We have a translation to English, if you don't understand me. I would like to know from Veronica about the feminist movement in relation to the political training of women and the place of these practice within revolutionary movements. Here in Brazil, we seem to be behind and the isolation of this debate uh, causes delays in achievements for women and also in politicization. This question is by Rosa Skaskechi. And we have another one. Uh, good afternoon. As I understand uh, your research, Veronica, the financialization is uh, enclosing in the domestic environment, the work and the social reproduction activities. Do you believe that the provision of supporting equipments would be enough not only to reduce the debt of women, but also to expand the territoriality of social reproduction beyond the house? to the community and to other spaces. I believe these were the questions. Well, I'll try to comment all of them. I shared the link of a book that was just published in Brazil with uh, the Elefante publisher, which is this compilation that we carried out with Lucy Cabajero and Zida Federici of different experiences in Latin America, most of all, but not only of financial disobedience practices that uh, go from the construction of a collective of loans and the fight for houses and for land. Because what we do when we expand the understanding of these indebtedness dynamic and how they're connected to uh, vulnerability, ways that are intrinsic to neoliberalism and the financial capital global policy and how it extracts value from these populations. By expanding what we understand as debt, we can also expand the notion of what are the ways to combat debt. And the ways to combat that debt are fighting for more fair salaries, fight for good quality housing. And this debt has to do with an in demand, uh, demand for infrastructure, right? 
of housing, of services, and of resources, but also uh, for income and salaries, for community work, for caregiving work, for domestic work. And this causes the debt to be compulsory and mandatory. So in order to uh, dismantle the situation where acquiring debt is mandatory to live, we need to dismantle all the ways that all the forms of exploitation that make debt be the main solution for social reproduction. So how can we think about the social reproduction dynamics? It seems to me that that is the question. How can we discuss the provision of services, the provision of, for example, food, uh, today in Argentina, what we have been discussing is that most of the debt, uh, we are talking about acquiring debt to pay for food, medication, and rent. This is social reproduction debt. It's debt to live. So how to get people out of debt? How can we uh, guarantee other forms of access and provision of goods and services that dismantles debt as the only possible solution. And for public policies to be a way to get people out of debt that is concrete and effective, not only by adding other forms of debt. And in that sense, when uh, one of the questions uh, how can people go beyond the houses? When we think about what it means for a place to be indebted, immediately the cartography of the territory of that place is expanded and open. And how is this place related to community work? How is this uh, place related to paid and non-paid labor dynamics? And uh, once we uh, put into question the enclosement of that space, we can advance uh, on that because the financial capital always elects the expanded cartography of the domestic territories. And I believe that in Argentina, it was interesting to have the discussion between several feminist organizations in relation to debt. And the acquiring of debt with the International Monetary Fund in Argentina ever since 2018 coincides in a moment of peak in the feminist movement and its fights and achievements. And at that moment, we were discussing the debt of women who acquire debt to abort and uh, getting abortions as a source of debt for women. So if we connect the discussion of debt with different things in the feminist agenda, uh, is really important for discussing debt, almost as a set of economic violences and discussing in what sense sexist violences that we were uh, protesting were completely related to economic violences and specifically what we call financial violence. And this is how debt makes especially women work more and have a set of maladies, uh, physical and mental due to these financial obligations and having a set of gender roles that held them accountable to several things, including paying debt and providing caregiving. So uh, it was very interesting how the feminist movement has opened and popularized this debate about the social reproduction we will have an additional two minutes, and I forgot asking a question by Thais Moreno, so I'll ask it. But I believe that uh, what's most interesting that you're proposing is this coordination between indebtedness and rethinking the domestic environment. But the question, I'll ask it in Portuguese. 
Veronica, I studied in my master's the financialization going to popular territories through a new renovations program in the peripheries and how the women inserted dealt with debt and a more critical discussion about the dynamics of debt needs to advance in Brazil. And she asks, I would like to hear what you think about the following point. Is it still possible to think about public policies that are not financed in a production mode that is completely financed since financialization is a global process that encompasses all aspects of day-to-day -day life. So how can we move away from financialization? And this would be my last question. And if you want to conclude as well. Veronica and Paula, I just wanted to make a comment to say that it would be very interesting to continue this discussion also expanded in the context not only of South Africa, where we currently have a lot of indebtedness and financialization, but other contexts where we don't have such a strong relationship between financialization and where we see women that are not as indebted living precariously, precariously but still not indebted and how we could discuss that in the future. Thank you, Veronica, sorry to interrupt, perfect. Well, about the question asked by Thais, I think that is key because yes, our states specifically are completely articulated with financing and global financing dynamics that oblige public policies to be focused and to follow this logic that we think is the logic of the financial capital of uh, cutting salaries, cutting services, but offering subsidies that are very specific or offering debt to pay for pre-existing debt. And I believe there is a discussion during the pandemic and as how we can uh, interfere with the public banks, this mandatory indebtedness due to the emergencies. And it's also a very important discussion about the regulation of these financial instruments, like how, like virtual platforms for taking out loans, which are currently the more accessible ones, but are also the ones that charge uh, abusive interest. So uh, I believe that there's not one possibility to disconnect absolutely the states in our country from this dynamic of the financial market, but there is a possibility for these public policies to not follow the mandates of the global capital in its neoliberal sense of taking away and then repairing in a very focused and specific sense that uh, is related to the policies in the 90s in the more classical sense. And about what, what Priscilla said, I believe that the debt index, it, it's a debt of increased vulnerability. It is a deeper level of vulnerability that makes uh, or produces this accumulation of neoliberal policies and debt uh, will appear as the only possible solution. And we also need to decompose other mechanisms of social organization, other economies of reproduction that avoid that debt will be the only way of surviving. This also seems interesting to me for debt to appear as the main element of social reproduction, we previously will need to compose other subsistence and reproduction economies. Because another point that we didn't have time to talk about, but debt is a hyper individualizing device. So the bankerization and the debts are related 
to extreme individualization. And when there are other elements, other networks, other subsistence economies that allow debt to not expand in the way that it has expanded in many of our countries, it's related to the in to preventing these individualization mechanisms from achieving success through other alternatives. And currently in Argentina, for example, we can say there is a high level of debt and also a high level of social and popular organization. And the debt uh, also appropriates community collective work, but always uh, putting uh, the figure of depth as an element of extreme individualization, which is also a very important concept uh, for depth. Thank you so much. We will have uh, to finish because we need to take a break for the translator, but the translators, but thank you so much, Veronica, and a demercantilized and uh, without depth, uh, is what we want. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I wish you a wonderful event. And we will come back during the afternoon talking about mobility at uh, 2.30 in Brazil. And what time in Africa, Priscilla? Just a second, guys. Uh, 7.30, right? 7.30 p.m. So in a little bit less than an hour, an hour, we'll be back. Thank you so much, Veronica. Thank you. Thank you, everybody who uh, was watching. We are excited to, to have you in Brazil. I'll be uh, there in November in Parachi. So see you in Parachi. Great. Bye-bye. Já desliguei sim, professora. Já. Não, desliguei não, tá, tá no intervalo, avisando que volta às duas e meia. Não tá não, não tá não, professora. É só a música lá.
Uh, you can call me Tule. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm very happy to be here with you all. Oh, <laughs> thank you for concerning me on my time zone. Now it is the uh, zero thirty in the new day. <laughs> Yeah, so it's 29, I think it's 10, 10 hour differences. Yes, I am here too late. Thank you.
Tô sim, professora. Vamos sim. Então, eu já vou liberar aqui, professora. Tô liberando a imagem e o som. Pronto. Good afternoon. I'm opening the this panel, so it's going to take two hours, so until maximum 4 p.m. local time. So after an excellent morning and afternoon, and afternoon in in Africa and I don't know in the other places, I'm Paulo Santoro. I'm going to introduce Paulo Soto. That's going to be a mediator today. It's a fellow from research. We are working together since 2019, uh, mating ideas, exchanging ideas in between intersectionality. So it's a pleasure. She's a professor and researcher in the sociology department in uh, the University of Mexico. And participates in the area of space and society. He's a part of the researcher teams level two that must be uh, equivalent uh, in uh, here in Brazil. The, it's equal from the ones that have a scholarships here at the, uh, our university. So Paulo, the floor is yours. Thank you to me. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm sorry, the audio is very far away. I'll try to do my best. This boundary that we have along with Marina Harbor. I'm sorry, the audio is not very good. So to start, we have access uh, to mobility. So it's a great pleasure to be here. So Marina was taken from an in event like this. Marina would be mediating and sharing the social media, taking pic, uh, driving questions from this subjectivity. So Marina refer for something that's over uh, just regulatory issue. She look at two feelings, emotional feelings. Marina was a cyclist guiding, uh, sorry, she was a professor and she was a sister, a daughter, and was part of a chain of solidarity and uh, working through a work that, uh, fights for a non-neutral uh, society. Next year, me and Marina will make 10 years of friendship. We were master's colleague and we support ourselves in the doctorship. With Marina, I knew better Sao Paulo City, a look that I don't want to abandon. So Marina started by mobility as a uh, territory for everyone, mainly the women question that uh, the, the environment was not designed for any bodies other than male bodies. Marina saw the seed beyond mobility and her biggest contribution was on this field. I see many names that worked along with her and she was just starting. I feel her around the city, intersectionality created by her. And she said that we need a Latin America look to think about the experience around the city. 
Conceição Evarista, Maria Carla Cotirene, Sueli Carneiro, were some of the names in which she had some dialogues to talk about the subjectivities. As his her research says said that she that these spaces wasn't from the uh, cars and buses. So we can find people around the city. Marina, I, we miss her very much. And she fought for more fed justice. She's always with us. And this Saturday we have an event in her honor, starting from her uh, mural. I'm sure that she wants to be here today and cycle with Marina. Thank you, Bruna. Marina leaves. Thank you very much. I am so thankful to remember that. It's a joy to talk about her. And we are going to start about the mobility message. Oh, you have 10 minutes to talk about that. And when we get eight minutes past, we are, you are going to receive a warning. The protection of the public spaces. So this work is from Mexico City and uh, was made by Diana and Jessica de Souza Andrade. Welcome, Diana and Jessica, and uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I'm going to continue. I started the presentation, and I start saying about the collective Derivas Urbanas located in the city of Sao Paulo. So we use the intervention as a tool to founding strength and landscapes. And uh, at a uh, cultural space, the collective start to build a partnership with women that had their research uh, based in urban space. So the result of this connection between, uh, between research is connected with a joint actions made in the 80, March 80 in a symbolic date. So we glue signs, uh, statistics da data, mobilize not only the people from Mexico City, Sao Paulo, and share the knowledge of uh, in a daily basis about violence, that point how these urban spaces are hostile to some bodies. Good afternoon. I'm Diana Canela. I'm sorry because I speak Portuguese and I hope to be as clear as I can. As Jessica mentioned, it's a symbol as a common sense, the collective uh, sense to talk about the necessities that the society has. We had to talk about this conflict in the public space and talked about prejudices. That is a critical a fruit of a critical work that transform the imaginative space and could be able to create sensible experiences. And that implicates this conceptive uh, framework uh, around the political uh, rights that we are fighting for. So in, in which point we can drive the process to that. On one hand, the urban student are center in a technocratic framework 
and a public space intervention, especially in Latin America, the place where the gender studies occupy have uh, uh, those kind of speech that are so intentionally uh, taught. So uh, the agenda produces systems that do not mention the factual issue to the women in the city. So this interdisciplinary addition, we have aspects that uh, in the past seemed up the, the opposite. We join architecture, architecture and um, other things. So what implies in a city is the transformation to transform that in a political place. So we start to think how to uh, correlate art and politics. What are the consequences to conceive the urban space as a um, access space? And the art is related to the politics for because it generates the distribution of the space as a symbol of that. So we can start to talk about uh, uh, that give conditions to identify the subject that constructed. So in this way, and Hans Yer quotes, the artistic manifestations contribute to manifest the landscape from what we know that we like to observe. And using the idea of the tactics the urban action is going to operate in the tactics and in the communities. We have a planning for the ones that organize the intervention in the urban landscape, but we have to have a spontan spontaneity. The project will be perceived during its um, happening. In that dynamic outside from the one that most seen provocative and reflexive through the through the those signs that are glued in the wall and the sculpture without any social class distinction subjectivity And uh, anthropology is a concept that's situated in the walk school, sensible, that um, is pays attention on the daily life of the city. And many times is made by, I'm sorry, the audio is very low. I don't catch some words. So I'm really, really sorry. So it's a small reflection and open a methodological process and collaborative production to produce the intervention in the urban space. The critical argumentation of the phenomena that we can see many times are about an utopia, something that happened in the collective imagination represent uh, that they miss the freedom. So historically, it was submitted to under uh, several questions and the ge geography that comes from uncertainty. So in our investigation center, we confirmed that the issue got in its base, a uh, capitalist and hegemonic issue as part of the theoretical framework for the organization of the speech that we have to build, where we are going to need an articulation of the urban practices and arts of fights that in our case are going to be changed by the political speech with the goal to create between them something that will be 
constituted as plural and uh, needs to decrease the inequality. So they contribute from our proposal to the thesis that postulated the conversion of the urban space. So that's part of the movement and the visibility of the super, sub, 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 uh, human act. So to conclude as argument, we intend from uh, the practice of uh, the called critical art, we have to assume that those manifestations could be able to build new ways of subjectivity through the responses, emotional re responses that are able to produce in the inhabitants. So we can touch the individual levels, the same theory, theory to reestablish new habits. If we can modify the external speech, that ideological uh, ideas that we internalize, probably we can witness this, witness the act that change the thoughts and is enough to so we can see the things in a different way and perceive new possibilities so it could uh, make a relationship between the use of the public space and the politics that fundamental the ethical uh, show so we can transform that into symbol that transgress the pre-established order. The intervention means that it has only one thing in common, the possibility to touch uh, the affection, uh, the place inside any kind of body. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jessica. And it was an excellent beginning of the table, trying to find the collaboration between the public spaces and the architecture. And I'm sorry, the audio is low. And present. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me clearly? Ah, thank you. So let me share my screen first. Can you see my uh, screen now? Let me chat it if it's move. Can you see the slide move? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so good day, everyone. Uh, again, I am Dule from Vietnam. I'm going to present my research uh, project connecting urban mobility and gender role, a case study from Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. My background in economics and mathematics, uh, and I have working experience in development economics, focus uh, on women economic empowerment. Transportation uh, infrastructure and services are essential for everyone's well-being, but they are not gen uh, gender neutral. And integrating a gender focus uh, into transport policy and uh, planning can promote equal economic opportunity for all, expecting to unlock barrier to women's economic potential. A brief introduction about Ho Chi Minh City is the largest city in Vietnam and the country economic hub. People in Ho Chi Minh City, especially women, face challenges uh, using transportation, including congestion, poor in, uh, infrastructure, and harassment. In general, 
gender and mobility research began in the 1970s with scholars from various fields highlighting the importance of gender sensitive transport infrastructure. Site infrastructure in infrastructure can economically empower women, increase social mobility, and create new job opportunity in the transport sector. However, gender in transportation had been noted in only recent years, study mainly carried out in the country with developed uh, public transport. The care of Vietnam had many differences that uh, need to be studied. Vietnam is a developing country. Uh, both men and women have to work for earning income for the family. And women in Vietnam have a double burden, take on an equal social role like men, but also have to fulfill the ob obligation in the family according to the cultural con uh, uh, traditions. And in Vietnam, uh, the private means of transport like motorcycle are, are mainly used. And this study fills the gap in the literature by providing evidence of cohesive, uh, um, a cohesive relationship between urban mobility and gender role based on data from the survey case study. In, in this study, we use the concept of mobility of care from the Madagia and Lucini uh, to design the data collection along with the real contact uh, in Ho Chi Minh City. We use a random effects model to examine the differences in the time due for transportation and unpaid work uh, between men and women in various backgrounds. I think that uh, my research is quite different with uh, a more of you here uh, that you use a qualitative uh, method and, and my research is main use a quantitative methods. I hope you enjoy. And uh, uh, firstly, uh, we see the gender, gender differences in time traveling for daily activity, including uh, traveling time for work, for education, for escorting, for shopping, and, and others. On average, women travel 0.4 hours less than men per day, especially in traveling for work. On, on average, uh, men spend about 105 minutes on commuting, while the women spend about 80 minutes. And the difference is more for now uh, for those who are married and living with family. Um, we also uh, uh, examine the uh, gender difference in time traveling for wiki activity, including the time traveling for entertainment, for visiting, uh, for healthcare, and for social uh, activities. Uh, in general, there's uh, no significant difference between women and men in traveling for weekly uh, activity. However, for a group of uh, married women who living with family uh, travel for for entertainment, let them let them men do. So we also look at the the time that men and women spend uh, in the daily unpaid work, uh, including how work and child care or the time for taking care of family member. On, on average, women spend 0.5 hours more than men per day for unpaid work. And we see that the women, the women spend more time on how work and child care while they uh, have less time for their own uh, entertainment. We noticed that entertainment here is not unpaid work, but I put it here for you to see that the women have to trade up their own time for leisure uh, to, to do the hard work. And to connect the differences between mobility pattern and gender roles, we analysis the correlation between unpaid work and uh, traffic time and compared to men, if women spend an additional hour on how work, they will reduce their daily travel time by 0.36 hours. 
mainly uh, by reducing time spent on travel for work, for education, and other activity. Uh, similarly, compared to men, if the women increase her work time by one hour per day, she will reduce her uh, weekly uh, travel time by 0.4 hours per week, including travel for entertainment, visiting, healthcare, and social activity. Um, in Ho Chi Minh City, um, in the uh, transportation experience, more women feel physically stressed than men, perhaps due to their um, weaknesses in the physical. And another factor might be the reason for, uh, for disadvantage of women mobility is that women own uh, more, more motorbikes and car and as well as a driving license less than men. And in Ho Chi Minh City, motorcycles are the most popular means of transport. And in that general situation, women tend to choose safe vehicle or the vehicle driven by others. Uh, in the using bus uh, experience, in compare with men, more women were harassed, but slave women were stolen. And here are three key findings uh, that the audience can take away from this presentation is that we saw uh, an evidence of clear relationship between urban mobility and gender roles, and a clear evidence of women trade off between less traveling than men and carrying more unpaid work in the family. And also we see the disadvantage of women in traffic due to their limitation. Uh, the finding from this research will be directly used to inform the Ho Chi Minh City Department of Urban Transportation to design gender inclusive projects. And also from finding of this research will open up the further direction for future research in the field of study. Thank you for your attention. And I welcome only comment and uh, question from, from you. We will now continue with the panel and the third work are the production of the space based on women who are living in the street and the presenter will be Leticia Marquez from the Federal University of Minas Gerais. You have the floor Leticia. Good afternoon everybody. Let me share my presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Leticia. I have a master's in geography here at the University of Minas Gerais. And this is part of my dissertation, which is still being finalized. And uh, this work is based on the observation and experiences of the urban space. Mostly during the pandemic, there was an increase in people living in the streets, given the social vulnerability, which was accentuated at the time, and I analyzed the municipality of Belo Horizonte, and I talk about the structuring duality between uh, public and private spaces, public, the urban space, and private, the space of the house. 
and according to gentrification, the public space would be the male space and the house would be the female space. And women living in the streets would break with that logic and they are vulnerable and they are obliged to occupy this space in the street and they need to find new ways to exist in that space. And women are a more vulnerable group due to the gender issues. And in the municipality of Belo Horizonte, 80% of the street population is black and mixed. So the racialized individual also faces other vulnerabilities. And when we think about people living in the streets, we look at them as a homogeneous group because most of them are male. So this causes the specific needs of women and people with uteruses to be made invisible by public policies. And this hinders us from thinking about public policies based on gendered needs. So the public spaces have this male character and the considering the gender issue women living in the streets are further vulnerabilized and according to a piece of data about street population brazil has over 158,000 population living in the streets and a good part of them are women um, and my work aims to understand the street based on the experiences of these women because the spatiality acquires new meanings according to the individual that occupies that space. So a racialized women with several intersectional issues has a very different perspective and attributes different meanings to the public space based on the and so these bodies and are marginalized and socially erased and they're denied citizenship, the right to the city. So the street population is always in transit through the urban space and producing new experiences through their existence and resistance. May I just ask, uh, are you moving between the slides because we can't see them. We still see the first side. Now we see now we see them. So the methodology I'm based in feminist geographies, which is a line that is associated to cultural geography, which arises in the 70s with uh, other social movements, the black and the feminist movements. And by questioning the universality of geographic knowledge, we claim a science produced by women. And here we think about spaces as multiple and results of specific interactions that can be interpreted and experienced in many ways according to the individual and understanding these spaces as results of power relations in hierarchies that define the subjects and allow them to occupy spaces or not. And with that, we try to understand the space of the street based on these women experiences. And here the space, oops, can be experienced through this multiple individuality and there are several possibilities of coexistence and this space is experienced and seen in many ways. And the street can be seen a place of fear and unsafety, but for these women, it acquires other meanings as well. Many of these women move away from violence situations they experience at home. So the street becomes a more welcoming space and the gender and race issue makes it being necessary to have strategies that involve the creation of groups and solidarity networks and care networks. And sometimes women need to find male partners to protect themselves in the street so as not to be violated. But the meanings, the multiple meanings are produced like that and different geographies are produced through these experiences in occupying the street. And here in Belo Horizonte, we had recently 
a project for the urban restructuring. So I noticed that ever since the beginning of my field work until now, there was a huge visual shift and the gentrification factors that are happening in the city potentialize the vulnerability of these groups and their displacement and impacts their relationship to the urban space. So many of these groups are being removed from the center of the city and becoming even more vulnerable. And that's it, thank you. Well, I believe your work emphasizes a group of women that is made very much invisible the women who live in the streets and also the idea that they are specific groups and also having the body of these women as a political space. And this causes us to think about uh, other issues like race and, and intersectionality and uh, the fact that they live in the streets and the several problems that that implies. Thank you so much, Leticia. So now the fourth paper, it's called Critical Notes to Urban Planning based on a theoretical, a feminist theoretical methodological perspective. And the presenter will be Clarice Cunha Linke, Rosana Bandão Travares with the Federal Fluminense University of Architecture and Urbanism. Go ahead. We can see your presentation. Okay, can you hear me? Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you see my presentation and my slides? Great. So good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here in this afternoon with you. And ever since the morning, it's been very fruitful. Thank you for inviting me. I'm Clarice. I am a PhD student at uh, UFF and my supervisor is Hosanna. She's not here today, but she's here either way. And I think it's important to say how I came to this position. I have worked with urban model mobility for uh, 11 years, specifically with urban mob mobility in Brazil. I work in an international institute which focuses on incidents in public policies for urban mobility nationally, internationally, regionally. So. I do direct work with that, and I have dialogue with development agencies, banks, governments, and sometimes I am bothered by the planning process and the reflection process and production of knowledge about mobility. And that's why I started studying again to think about this process. So in my context, in the last decade, the urban mobility theme has been having a lot of emphasis in global agendas due to the climate emergency, the quality of the air, the cost of the transportation. So there's an entire discussion and a very high investment in decarbonization processes. So significant investments by several actors, governments, agencies, private initiative, and also civil society organized or not but both public and private investments in urban systems that are very much aligned with neoliberal narratives to guarantee productive work and in the invisibilization of reproductive work. So I think we all agree here that this is a patriarchal, white, colonial, sexist, heteronormative perspective on the future of cities and with gender issues being captured by these actors. It's a theme that is very co-opted by these capitalist actors. And what uh, encouraged my research is researching who actually benefits with, from this new design of the city. 
in urban planning, we have a practice that invisibilizes women and the reproductive work. And I think that's also a consensus in this environment here, in this group. So we are committed, we have a historical commitment based on uh, rationalist and positivist uh, perspectives. This commitment with the, the standardized cis person and a male person. And this is a planning that produces spaces structured to facilitate patriarchal family units and productive work in general, and that ignores this connection between productive and reproductive work, including through the oppression of women. And as a result, we have the experience of women in the city and in the mobility system, which is very invisibilized. And I'm also interested in dealing with the invisibilization of the daily travels of these women who live in the peripheries, low-income women, predominantly Black in the Brazilian context, and who are the main people responsible for care practices, not not only in their families, but as part of their uh, paid labor. So taking care of multiple families. And I'm interested in analyzing how the planning of the mobility system invisibilizes the experience of these women in their design, planning and management and contributes to the perpetuation of social precarity and stigmas and stereotypes and we know very well, uh, Marina Hako was a scholar about a typical day in women's lives. And many of my reflections are based on my discussions with her. So I uh, am based on a theoretical perspective that uh, considers the experiences of women in the cities in terms not only of productive work, but reproductive work and to play these roles that are connected to traveling also for productive work. And we deal with frequent travels, close and distant locations at varied hours, sometimes outside of the peak and with different needs and with more frequent layovers. So uh, travels that are planned outside of a system that is the traveling between home and work, which is basically what men usually do. And public transportation has a central role in women, especially the ones that live in peripheries. And there's an aspect that I have been trying to explore based on what Veronica Gago and other researchers and thinkers have said, which is how the neoliberal attack to state policies, including the precarization of urban modality systems, makes women responsible for uh, care work, usually women, sometimes elderly women or pregnant women, even more vulnerable. And here I link this to Veronica's discussion. When we see the cost of the transportation, the cost of the ticket, and also uh, the acquiring of debt to buy cars and automobiles in many installments, because sometimes it's the more viable way of uh, moving around in the cities. And this also confirms this growing process of indebtedness. And uh, according to my documentary research, and as a professional in the sector, I have uh, been uh, doing a very diverse type of research. And what we see is that the protagonism of capital, especially automobile and technology industries, the climate emergency scenario negatively affects all sectors in societies, but it also uh, makes a lot of opportunities for these sectors specifically. And uh, 
possibility to modernize these sectors in investment in new communication technologies, automobile technologies, symbolically renew these sectors, but based on an approach that is ageist, technocratic, and operational. So we have an entire process of adoption or capture of social environmental themes and uh, identitary agendas, but through a reformist perspective. This is not converted into a structural change, but just trying to secure the full working of this exploration system that we already experience. So what I'm mapping right now, and I'm sharing with you, are some ideas, they're not results, but what I'm mapping is by ignoring the centrality of the travels through the city for reproductive and care work, including paid care work, and by not articulating the modes of oppressions experienced by different women, and I think Paula's comment previously in our context, women of color, women of low income, women who li live in the peripheries, who are the main caregivers, we have a design, a planning, and a management of urban mobility, mobility that invisibilizes social groups, territories, and spatial practices of the daily lives in the cities reiterating patriarchal and racial domination forms. So we see some absences, uh, we, we see some assumptions like universality, rationality, where we have the use of quantitative data like uh, in the case of labor, that completely ignore other types of travels that are not related to productive travels, ignore racial perspectives, research focused in characterizing the travels, but not the conditions of the travel, mobility plans that do not mention the racial issue, and that point to gender issues in a very incipient manner, representation, so maps, we use a lot of maps that are selective, and here we have a risk of belie believing in these maps as the complete truth about the territory, and also the adoption of the intersectionality term, but in the sense of organizing categories, but not actually producing a rupture or a political perspective on how to produce knowledge. This is my last slide. Uh, and where do I wanna get with my research? Well, designing assumptions that will allow us a new theoretical methodological approach that is feminist and intersectional, and that is based on the actual experience of women and the oppression that they serve, that they, they suffer, the specificities in their travels that uh, questions the hegemonic narrative that currently feeds investment that have a fundamental intersectional aspect and that have a more political character in the dispute of mobility. So it's a research that is feminist and that questions the male nature of the current research or the business as usual. So that's where I'm at and what I had to share with you. And I'm excited uh, to discuss with you since I am in the middle of my methodological discussion. Thank you. And the mobility uh, and the center of the intersectionality is, uh, I'm sorry, the audio is very low, I can't hear. And how this difference is translated, observations, and we cross many ways.
So we see the necessity to integrate the intersectional perspective. Thank you very much. And now we are going to hear our 50 speakers. Oh, um, I'm sorry, I can't hear. And some Marvin, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Just give me a second. Um, is my screen visible now? Okay, perfect. Um, yes, so good evening, everyone. Um, I'm originally from Pakistan, but I'm based in Germany, so it's um, almost nighttime here. Um, I'm a design researcher and my research usually revolves around gender and urban spaces through the lens of feminist scholarship and this research that I'm presenting here was actually a part of my um, master's thesis. So um, I will start off by saying that cities become gendered spaces when the needs of one gender are prioritized over the other and everyday lived experiences of women are not taken into account in the designing of cities. Feminist geography and urban planning scholars recognize that the existing infrastructure around mobility and transportation restricts and constricts freedom of movement, thereby impacting how women and the marginalized move throughout the city. I situated my research in my hometown, Karachi, which is the largest city in Pakistan and is ranked as 13th largest city worldwide. According to the formal census, its population is nearly 15 million, it is the economic and business hub. It is also the most linguistically and ethnically heterogeneous city where people of multiple faiths and ethnicities and languages reside, including migrants and refugees. The purpose of my study is to understand gender differences in commute, particular, particularly the ways how women navigate the city differently. Karachi, like any other mega city, has expanded rapidly, but it remains afflicted by lack of a mass, proper mass transit system. Moreover, the complexity of ethnic differences, class, gender, and religion has obstructed the city's progress as a safe and inclusive environment for marginalized women. I have firsthand, ex firsthand experienced how the absence of public transport affects women's everyday lives. Thus, mobility by public transport, particularly rickshaws, became my area of focus. To explain my positionality as a designer and researcher, it is important for me to begin from the geography closest to me. That is my everyday embodied experience of navigating and moving through Karachi. I have grown up, lived, and worked there all my life. I have commuted in rickshaws, buses, and cabs alone. I have walked on roads and footpaths and pedestrian bridges on my own, but never in leisure. And so this forms the point of departure from where I explore and research. I started off, started off, started off by exploring the concept of a feminist city and feminist right to the city. I probed how women navigate the city differently through the use of rickshaws in Karachi. My research maps their commuting patterns and behaviors with the intention of uncovering the unspoken communal practices that reveal how pockets of feminist cities are enacted in the here and now, and also to, understand, uh, to broaden our understanding of gendered commute. I explore modes of resistance adopted by marginalized women when it comes to navigating the city on their terms. My theory framework, my theoretical framework was root, uh, anchored around intersectional feminism and feminist standpoint theory, which says that uh, women uh, or people who live in uh, on the marginalized peripheries are better informed from where to begin the research. And so moving uh, and so taking this into consideration, I did online surveys, but then I did not want myself to be limited to be limited by techno, techno, technology or women who do not have access to technology. So I also conducted telephonic and in, informal interviews with salaried women. I also reached out to the local trans community and uh, interviewed a trans women. And I also conducted um, informal interviews with rickshaw drivers who 99% of the time are men in, at least in Pakistan. So in many South Asian countries, um, rickshaws are three-wheeler paratransit vehicles um, that have filled in the void of a proper public transport. Rickshaws are the second most popular transport mode after buses, and women especially rely more on rickshaws because it provides door-to-door -door services and is found in all areas of the city. Plus, there is also the unspoken safety factor that since it is an open vehicle, it would be easy to jump out in case things take a dangerous turn. They are more expensive than buses, so women end up paying more because safety is their top concern. 
The results that I derived from my study also confirm that the usage of rickshaw is not an alternative cheap mode of transport, but is dependent on class and accessibility. Rickshaw drivers also said that women tend to use familiar routes, even if it means using longer routes, because that's how they feel more safe and insecure. And they also acknowledge that, yes, cities are unsafe spaces for women. I was also interested in uh, finding out how, uh, what are the standard ways of communication and navigation design in an urban space? So um, my research proved, or my research uh, and re revealed that Google Maps is the standard um, digital app that is used for navigation. But then the question ar arose that how do women who are don't, or women from low income communities, um, if they don't necessarily have a smartphone, then how do they navigate the city, especially when they have to go to unfamiliar destinations? Um, so it turns out that, and then that's how, uh, and also through my conversations with some other ur urban planning experts, the this this theme of commuting to embodied knowledge emerged, which meant that Karachi lacks, lacks a well defined public uh, well defined transport map system. So how how people usually get around the city is just by using like asking people on the roads or asking shopkeepers, and the way of navigation is very landmark landmark based. So they will say that you know go right left from here till you reach the shop with the Pepsi logo, then you turn left from there, we will see a building with the uh, with the blue gate, then you turn right from there, straight go ahead and, and you understand like it's all based on the X Y Z directions. And so um, the question about how are design inter interventions needed where people seem to be content li living with contradictions, it's important to understand um, how what are the needs and wants of the society or people or women who are marginalized women who are living there instead of imposing our own technological solutions onto them. So, and another thing that was revealed was that um, there is this factor of that familiarity is a key component of safety. Um, nearly all the women I spoke with prefer hiring the neighborhood rickshaw wala. And wala, I will say, is like a Urdu term which signifies belonging. So it can also mean rickshaw driver or rickshaw wala. So rickshaw drivers often make one area of the city as their base for many years and become acquainted with everyone in that neighborhood. And when women, um, when they become acquainted with everyone in their neighborhood, then the women of the neighborhood also become acquainted with the rickshaw driver and even to the extent of knowing who their family is. So they feel more safe and secure in usually hiring or going to unfamiliar destinations with the rickshaw drivers from their neighborhood instead of hiring someone, uh, hiring a rickshaw for all, like from another um, strange area of this unknown area of the city. Another thing that emerged was that there is not, uh, well, not uh, currently a very well existing, uh, well-defined uh, information distribution system by the government. And unfortunately in Karachi, um, Karachi is very prone to like having road and traffic situations that can that are obstructed by uh, an unannounced political rally, or there is like a flood flooding due to sewerage and open gutters, or um, due to like uh, urban flooding because of a lot of, because of severe rain. So there is always like uh, some kind of like, it's, it's not instantly observed, like it's not instantly, um, it, you cannot find out instantly like you know, which road is blocked or how to really like uh, choose an alternative route because again, Google Maps is not, it's not, it's not something that updates that fast. And so people came up with like alternative ways. They like, uh, they made Facebook groups or they have like their WhatsApp groups on which they instantly update each other. So it's like colleagues informing each other, or you just go onto these Facebook groups and find out which area of the people upload videos there. And they say that, you know, hey, avoid this road. This is not safe for tonight, or um, you will be stuck here for hours and so on. And the, um, the intention behind this is that these acts of care, they reveal that there is not so much reliant on digital technology or digital app to be more precise, but that there is a sense of community and concern for the well-being of other that you know everyone is guiding each other it can be colleagues it can be your family members it can be your friends and even rickshaw drivers amongst themselves have a network of care like they will call up each other and say that hey um, you know don't take this route or take another one and so on um, uh, because of the lack of time, I won't go too much into it, but this was a really interesting uh, part of my research. And if um, we have time at the end, I would like to, you know, if anyone's in, I mean, anyone is interested, I would like to talk more about this later on. Um, and so I come towards uh, the end of my um, presentation right now. And this is, was this was like a constant thought throughout my research, which says that, um, like, how do I talk about my city without present, presenting Karachi through an orientalist lens? And how do I also talk about my city without denying the harsh realities 
and or without romanticizing the resilience, a term which has become associated with Karachiites and also which the city government tends to use it as a scapegoat because they will, instead of them improving the local infrastructure, they will say that, oh, yeah, people will adapt or people have been living back like this for decades. It doesn't matter. Um, so, but the idea here is that there is a fine line between romanticizing the struggles and celebrating and nurturing their acts of defiance and acknowledging that such feminist practices of urban resistance and seeing if their acts can be ampl amplified at a bigger scale. And also to understand that these acts do not nullify the harsh realities, but serve to add a layered perspective on the everyday life and interactions of marginalized women. And since I began with exploring the concept of a feminist city, I would say that my vision of a feminist city recognizes and celebrates the differences that coexist across gender, class, race, and religion. It entails practices and ideals that are being lived right now, whether or simply as alternative ways of knowing and living, because there is no one default. And now I've uh, actually reached the end of the, con uh, the presentation and um, thank you for your interest and I look forward to look forward to your comments and feedback. Thank you. the last presentation mariana thank you very much for being with us and the presentation is called the right to cycle around the city intersectional analysis made by women that cycle sorry inaudible and Mari Mariana Fetos and Paraya University. Thank you very much, Mariana. And the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon. How are you? Can you see my presentation? So this research is happening now. It's cohorts of my master's article in which I'm doing a research with uh, bicycle and women in Belém do Pará. And this is the first chapters in which I try through the narrative, biographic narrative of the women that help to build this research, try to understand how the bike promotes the access to the city and how it helps and how these women from the bikes can access the city. And this issue, in fact, my intention when I started, when I joined the masters, I'm going to talk about my academic background. My research was related to the city, my hometown, Yapok, has a border with French Guiana, and it was linked to a mobility research in the border and linked to housework and women. 
But when I came to Berlin, uh, the, uh, making my master's, so I got a scholarship. So I really would like to make a field search, but it didn't work. Last year, I joined a master in, in July. I finished my first semester of the master's. I joined an event, a national event that gathers several cycling activists and women that cycle and are in this scenario. So I worked as a volunteer doing the arts. At the time when I came to Belém, I brought my bike because my intention was to cycle around the city. But when I arrived in April, and from April to June, I didn't cycle because of it's very complicated to cycle. And Belém is one of the cities that the traffic violence is in the ranking of this traffic violence. So through my participation in this event with Spiscultura, I got to know three collectives, like Anjo Belém, Pedala Mala, and Coletivo Pedalas. And those three collectives, women are the majority of them that talk about mobility and engage women to cycle around the city. So this collective, Pedala Mala, and Pecnagio teach to cycle. And that my opinion. Because when I knew her, I started to cycle to my university. I live near here, so for me to get here, that's in the other side of the city, I have to cycle seven kilometers to go and seven to get back. And I go through this, this street, Momorukuzi Street, that has a cycle land that has uh, six kilometers of cycle land. So I was learning to cycle around the city. So I started to observe in this street that in the times that I cycled, the majority of people of cycling, of bikers were men. And then I started to cycle because in the groups that I, I'm joined, the majority are women. So I started to make questions when I suggest to change my research to make the research about mobility in Berlin and be why women are the minority. And when I start my research, I have some findings and find Marina Hackworth's research and she said, and she was the victim of the uh, traffic violence. She was uh, hit by a car in Sao Paulo. And she was part of the Black Angel National Network. And in her research, she showed that the, uh, the women are in the average of 6 and 7% that cycle in the city and are the same data that shows according to those reports that are made by Cycle, that it shows that women are here in the lane in average of One of the things that Marina shows in her research that the choices of the streets that are done to make that uh, research are commuting ways and usually women are not on the streets and on my experience I didn't hear about this street but on the Garapé that's in the peripheral neighborhoods I consider the one that had the highest rate of violence I don't consider that but it's what uh, the speech showed this street is where And when I bike in the Guama neighborhood is where I find the most women cycling. And uh, 
the streets chosen by women are routes where uh, from home to work and back, and they often make more stops than that. And here I have the Baiki Anjo School because I initiate my field work through the Pedalamana Collective. And after a while, I noticed that this collective is a female collective that is originated in the Baiki Anjo School. The, and the school has four pillars, bike in schools, which is uh, doing traffic education in the schools. We also have twice a year, the bike in the periferia, where we have biking events throughout the city many times a year. And uh, we also have the Bike Anjo, which is a group that teaches women to cycle in the streets. And then they go to the street and start cycling, following tips on how to cycle comfortably. And we also have the Bike in the Periphery project, which attempts to make to show the public power how important it is, uh, how important cycling is in some areas. And here I am carrying out interviews, currently I'm carrying out interviews and monitoring four women and trying to write their biographic narratives based on their uh, braids in their hairs and I do hair braids and that is uh, and these women ask me to braid their hair and I have done this a couple of times and usually this braiding work lasts between eight to ten hours so that's when I started talking to them and the bicycle theme came up a lot so my methodology also is related to the braiding of trajectories. And so I try to show uh, through these trajectories how the bicycle comes up. In the narratives of some of these people, they are women who live in periphery neighborhoods that are far away from the center of the city and who uh, ride their bicycles on a daily basis in the city to go to the store, to buy things. They usually never go between one point to another, and like men who are going to and from work. And most of these women do not work formally. Most of them have been married for a long time with a man, and they are between 48 and 52 years of age and they learned how to ride a bicycle as adults. I'm not looking at my time, so I apologize. So for example, Bia in 2018 joined the project and she has been bicycling for not a long time, but after she started, she thinks a bicycle was a vehicle that caused her to start accessing other spaces that she didn't access before. And when I say other spaces, I mean in the sense of autonomy, because she says that previously, before she learned how to bicycle or how to ride a bike, she had to go out with her husband because he's the one who has a car, so he would choose where she could go. And when she starts bicycling, she starts taking guitar lessons, she starts participating in workshops, and she experiences the city in a different way because of the bicycle. And she starts going places where she couldn't before because she would only go to the events where her husband participated. And in addition to that, the bicycle also comes up as a 
in their speech as a something that means freedom. They say the word freedom a lot. And the bicycle that I talk about, it's a bicycle that has a history, that has a name. Each one of the bicycles has a name and they treat the bicycle as if it was a child or even a companion that takes them to places they didn't think about going to before, not because they they couldn't do that financially, but because the bicycle allows for that. And in addition to that, the bicycle also comes up as a tool that makes these women uh, take a stand against the oppression and the violences that happen in traffic. So I have this picture here because one of my methodologies, so to speak, for of research is following the trajectories of some of them. So in addition to listening to them in this, uh, while braiding their hair, I bicycle with them through the city. And in this day, the light was green, but then it became red, and a car was running that red light. And usually when we bicycle, things like that happen. And these situations don't cause these women to stop cycling. They take a stand and they always try to see themselves as also part of the traffic. And another issue is that in their narratives, based on the moment that they started cycling, there was an improvement in their physical health and their mental health. Physical health comes up, but mental health comes up a lot more as a moment where the bicycle is a tool where they can express things that they didn't use to express before. It's almost like a therapy. It's what they say, when I'm tired, when I need to think, when I'm confused, I get on my bicycle and I feel better. Mayera, can you conclude your presentation? Yes, and to conclude, the bicycle also comes up as a financial aid because since they learn how to teach other people to cycle and they save money as well. So thank you and I'm here for the discussion. Thank you Mayara and the we started with a presentation this was a very important presentation about a mode of transportation that is increasingly relevant. Uh, the bicycle as an act of freedom, but also a political act, and that is connected to health and the well being. And the more presence, the, the increased presence of women in the city on a daily lives, in, women's, in women with different contexts. And so we will open the debate. There are some questions or comments. You can raise your hand and ask it directly to the panelists. Paula Santoro has a question. Well, a wonderful panel, and I would like to start by saying that I'm happy to see people from different continents talking about gender approaches and mobility, and it's challenging to weave questions that are common, but I would like to ask a question that is a personal question, because especially I thought it's related to what Clarice proposed. How can we think about intersectional methodologies that look at the different forms of oppression but without hierarchizing them? 
in terms of which oppression is more harmful or more important to transform, but also ways that allows us that allow us to understand and here I wanted to know if you see it the same way to understand a new production of knowledge based on the experience of modality of mobility sorry because I think all of you with the exception of Thule who has a more quantitative research you're all looking at the challenges in the experience of women while occupying public spaces. And this idea of experience at the center of the method is part of the decolonial approaches, the idea that we need to move away from quantitative research that looked at mobility as it traveling from one point to another in the quickest manner possible and in the cheapest manner possible. But what does it mean to look at it based on experience? And uh, while talking to people uh, here, they say, we can't think about the subway in terms of experience. It's really hard. But the research that looks at women who are choosing to use the subway in Sao Paulo, they choose that mode of transportation because they are doing things during the transportation, they are listening to music, they're able to do homework if they're taking a course. So understanding these mobility decisions is much more complex for us to think in terms of macro mobility based on micro mobility, on experiences, on daily life. So do you think that this idea of mobility uh, with experience as a methodological basis, if it makes sense, that's my first question. And I wanted to ask um, specific questions. Zainab Marfi, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but you say that women face the exclusion mechanisms and they go out into the world. They go out in rickshaw. But I ask, what are the strategies to deal with social exclusion, with gender oppression that they use? Do they travel together? Do they travel at a certain time? Are they uh, accompanied by a man? Because it's seems to be very similar, the strategies that you have there, which is a world that's supposedly different from my own, to the ones that we have here. So do you think there's anything in common? Is there a common patriarchy, a gender violence that always needs to, no matter the differences between the cities, between the territories, between the stories and backgrounds, if my city and yours that are very different, I'm from Sao Paulo, do you think both face gender oppression? Um, I think to start, these are my two questions. Very well. So I'll pass the floor to Clarice first. Okay. Thank you, Paula, for your question. And I'm also taking the decoloniality in urban planning course. Well, actually the course goes by several names, but I think it's very instigating thinking about the decolonial perspective. And speaking as someone who acts in the field more than uh, an academic, I think that this new production of knowledge it demands reversing a logic. So how can we do that with urban planners? We usually are based on models, scenarios, and data, and then we go out, we do a couple of fo focus groups just to illustrate as something that illustrates the data and the quantitative result that is based on predetermined values. 
on a specific perspective and you uh, illustrate that with experiences at most, but actually we would need to reverse that logic based on a different uh, scale and a different type of listening, uh, valuing of what is considered uh, lesser knowledge. And this type of knowledge would be we would redefine what type of data we collect, what we look to, and this may help us define what will we collect to put into a model and to do macro planning. But I think we would need to reverse the process and not only have a qualitative research or listening in a way that's much more specific and based on the territory practiced, uh, in all of its complexity as something that will merely illustrate a truth that you're trying to prove for that planning. But there's a huge challenge and we already had that challenge before, which is uh, major investments have time constraints and usually things uh, need to move very fast. And with all of that investment in decarbonization and et cetera, the time constraints are even bigger. So we have uh, uh, investment in biking lanes for in cycling lanes, for example, but it is an accelerated investment that doesn't really meet that type of requirement of considering the experiences. So we would need to deaccelerate these processes where we have the prevalence of time over space and not space over time, a planning that would perhaps not cause such disruptive measures, but would try to understand in loco the demands. And uh, I think these are not specific projects, but I think it would in general be a reversal of who defines the values, the logical framework that we use in the beginning of a urban planning. An idea that uh, is related to what Paula said is that uh, everything is related to the experience. The experience, hegemonic, sexist, puts at the center a specific experience, which is the experience of middle-class heteronormative male individuals. And that's also experience. And the question is, how can we change the importance given and the hierarchy of these experiences? Because the traditional planning uses the experience, but the male experience to talk about everyone's experience. So I believe the categories of experience are also important for urban planning. Uh, Zainab, would you like to answer Paula's question? Yes. Um, I'll start by saying that um, my one of my thesis advisor was actually from Brazil herself. So in our very first session, she we were both of us were amazed at the similarities um, in terms of the urban spaces and the uh, struggles that you generally go through when you are moving in a public space. Um, but I guess where it differs is that in Pakistan, uh, the public transportation is generally gender segregated. So there will be a separate compartment for women and a separate compartment for men, especially in buses. And generally those compartments for women are much smaller than for men. Um, also it's uh, now the trend is changing, but generally it's not culturally acceptable for women to go around riding motorbikes because you are supposed to sit in a very ladylike way on both your legs on one side. Um, this trend is now changing and a lot of young women are now resisting and defying and learning how to ride motorbikes. Um, another thing was that uh, another way of like them, like the very common, common concept was like carpooling together. So a bunch of um, uh, low in women from low income communities who work as um, a domestic house help in other people's home and if they come from the peripheries of the city. Um, they they have like they will have like they will book one richer driver who will pick them who will drop them in the morning and um and then pick them up in the evening and this is kind of like this is not how a normal rickshaw driver generally works because theirs is like you know their passenger keeps on changing time to time but this practice I feel is like very 
I don't know how common it is in the other countries, but in Pakistan, it's it's so common to just like, you know, have your rickshaw driver on like your speed dial and you just call them and say, hey, can you pick me up right now? And if they are in a far off country, they will, oh, not country, but like far off area, they will give you a time and to pick you up. Um, another thing that came up was that how do women, when they are just taking any, any random rickshaw on the road, how do they gauge that the rickshaw driver is not going to end up being a creepy person? And it was really interesting that some of the responses came up was that they will first gauge how the rickshaw driver is dressed, um, what kind of ethnicity do they think that the rickshaw driver belongs to? And this is something, a very, um, I think, a Pakistani rooted thing that there are always these kind of like, uh, not always, but uh, usually this kind of like, you know, un hostilities under the fabric of, under the, under the surface, like between um, people who come from different ethnic communities in the north or in the, in the or in like some other part. And, and like I mentioned that Karachi has a pretty big community, uh, like it's, it's, in, it's like a cosmopolitan city. So a lot of people from all around the country come here for work opportunities and it's uh, way more diverse compared to other cities in Pakistan. So, but then this also leads to these kind of tensions that are always there. Um, and and another thing was that uh, like uh, one woman I interviewed said that you know she does she can never really remember how like the areas of the city or which road to go and get there. So she said that in the initial days of marriage, her she though her husband did not accompany her anywhere, um, but he would make sure that he would draw draw like small maps for her so that she can find out uh, so that she knows that okay she has reached this landmark now she will reach the other landmark and then so on. And now, I mean, the hus her husband does not draw those maps for her anymore, but she has now like, you know, but and she still does not remember the address, uh, the addresses, but she has, she said that she has never let this become a hindrance for her. So she will, if she doesn't remember, then she will ask someone on the road. She will ask a police, a traffic police guy, or she will stop at the, uh, at the petrol um, gas station and ask them. So, and then she eventually gets there. Um, and another point that I want to mention about the romanticizing, not romanticizing their struggles is that while I was doing this research, during that year and a half, there were like many multiple incidents of really mind numbing violence that was coming, uh, violence against women that was coming out of Pakistan. Um, and me sitting in Germany at the time, I felt like, okay, whatever, what am I doing with my research? It feels like such like, you know, lofty ideals, someone who's like sitting in a safe cocoon in a country. Uh, in another country altogether, but, and then, um, and I, I feel like I'm in terms like, you know, thinking about Donna Haraway, like I'm still don't have an exact answer to this, but I'm staying with this trouble, staying with the trouble because I feel it compels me and moves me forward in my quest to kind of find out more about what it means to really resist. And also I was cognizant of the fact that again, feminism has a negative connotation in, 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 in my society. So not many people, especially women who are um, uh, don't necessarily come from an urban background, like they don't like to be associated with the term feminism or being called feminist. So I, uh, and for me, like this is my lens that I'm looking through at them. And I was very careful about not imposing this lens onto them that though, uh, I mean, this is what, I mean, the way they are resisting for me, it appears to be feminism, but if they don't identify with it, I should not be the one to impose it on them that what, what you're doing is a feminist act, for example. Um, yeah, I hope this answered your question. There is a question that I'm going to do. Paula says that that I really enjoyed the presentation from the bikes. And I would like to know, is there something in the education how to cycle? But this also has a comment. I understand that we have two questions for education for the debate. Sila, can you do that? Yes, I can make a question. I don't know if Clarice was in the discussion, previous discussion earlier, when we talked about the peripheral feminism. And I know that your work brings that difference from the discussion that we have uh, earlier because of a planning process which formal of a transformation of the city. 
of the ones that are more sustainable without leaving the hegemonic capitalist model. And it's a transformation <clears throat> to try to put mood model transportation. I don't know if it is the right term. So I ask if he, in your methodology, the observation of the peripheral territory or the peripheral, peripheral feminism. <clears throat> and transporting in these territories if it contributes for your research in a different way. Thank you, Priscilla. From the practice, what I would like, it's not only contribution, but something that guides and had a legitimate dialogue considered more legit in this uh, hegemonic project and to identify really gaps that we have. So in this kind of planning, that's a very functional way, uh, initiative from a social movement. So it's a very functional activity. So how we can do that it leaves this place and be what informs the planning, where the founding is going to. Uh, we have founding happening, some kind of investment that maybe it's bad, but it exists. And how it's guided by the other look. And my challenge, try to design a methodology. I'm at this moment in which we can emphasize and give legitimacy and more credibility, even technical, it's something in the epistemological way uh, in the situation that I got, not even consider something that's valid in the current practice. So how can we emphasize and show the importance for the ones that don't have the process, the planning process as a whole, I think, that we connected with the answer. Mayara Siqueira is going to answer. Thank you for your questions. I really like it. In Belém, it's a plain city. It's perfect to cycle. We don't have many ups and downs. We have uh, we don't have a lot of trees. We have thirty percent of uh, green areas here, but the concerning is about the traffic issue because we had a fear narrative that are input on people, so they wouldn't cycle. The streets are straight so we have to fight for space i joined a group whatsapp group because i didn't know how to a uh, cycle in the street so i got some teams and they say watch out for the cars because they push us outside of the street they honk, honk like for a dog and we couldn't be there and the main issue that stops people to cycle around uh, the street is how it's the bike shouldn't exist. And the cycle lanes will dispute them with the model bikers. So they uh, drive through those places and we have to create strategies to occupy by those places and regarding uh, the initiatives in schools yes, there is an attempt to take to the schools but it's a little bit hard and I know that we teach a lot of children how to cycle in the plazas and in the malls and in also, it engaged a lot of children. I think that's it. Just a comment. 
And I think that you bring the challenge of sharing. Like the car is the dominant vehicle, is the one that are in terror. So if we can, we can put this, the bike, you have to fight for it. So it's very hard. And I think that that's the idea of development. We have a denial of the uh, walk. I'm not from Belém, but I have family in Manaus. And I think it's absurd to cycle. It's like something outside from the world. And I propose that something that is a small kind of, it's under transportation. And it's so good because the city is so plain. Belém has some trees. I traveled to Belém and I said, why not? And it's amazing because people at the same time, they do cycling. And regarding those issues, recently I had a seven hour interview with one of my sisters. And she, she mentioned that when she lived in a municipality near, near here, she wants to cycle, but there was this moment that people said that the ones that cycle were poor. And so she had to deconstruct that because she was affected by this thought. Thank you, Mariana. Is there any other question or comment? To, I have several, I'm sorry. Jessica and Jan, I really liked your work, but recently I read a book that was a woman walking through the city, a white European woman, and she chose four cities to lost it herself, Lauren Elkin. And I was reading the book and I was very, very uncomfortable because I thought that women can do that. And on the other hand, I identify myself because I went to the cities that he, he, uh, she mentioned and I lost myself and I lived in some cities. But I thought that it was, I was uncomfortable. And then I got a provocation from her book that, of course, every woman got lost. The issue is about how and when. And you were uncomfortable with the city, where, where would she go? But it... I was talking about a long history. If I, is there any race in the bodies that could get lost in the city and how those bodies operate, how to get lost in the cities? And I was provocated by a book that I don't remember the name, Planes by Laurie Alkin. That seems to me like a white woman, but black women said, Paula, you have prejudice. Black women also can do that in several situations. So if you want to hear from them, how their raciality is important to tension the to, to the theory of Flanus. Jessica would like me to start.
Can you start again? Me with my portfolio. I would like to start saying that the importance of rethinking the issue regarding activism, it's already transgressor and it's fundamental. And as a researcher that goes to that uh, goes through the cities by bike and walk, all, not all of them are going to become activists. And the cities do not ensure the minimal right to mobility to its citizens. And we believe that in fact, the construction technocratical is what uh, stops power approaches for the domain of the factual. In Mexico City, for example, the governor, governmental uh, question, uh, the transport issue, we will not improve from academia. So here we ask ourselves what the field from academia and human science uh, are doing regarding this latent problem. Is the road on safety, the gender violence that oppress the women and not the nobody, it's not that something that don't come from technocracy, techno, technocracy. Because in the public service, they built uh, affirmative policies that's just like little fires. And are they're not public policies, in fact, at least in Mexico, when we talked about the get lost, we find demands on the streets itself. And it's hostility that live in cities like ours, uh, like we live, symbols that, Jessica, if you want to comment something else. I think that Gianna, answered it completely. I just would like to give, uh, add an information in the sense that her as architecture professor, me in the anthropology, try to gather thoughts and made as Paolo says to leverage a new methodological way to discuss those points. Not everybody are on academia, nor all the bodies have the same rights are join the public space. So it was done in several stages. So we did meetings, opening meetings, only from academia people and oh, this graphic hearing and uh, regarding the reports and points point, points of uh, recognition and implant a non institutionalized conversation and make an exchange some sentence he produce the signs to put in the public Basis. So we try to make this discussion outside the university and open to other ways of existence. People that felt touched, so they had the availability, they had the chance to join. Does that make sense? It's just to add something to Diana's comment, to seek for new ways to think. And also, I don't think that all the bodies has the right to lose themselves if we can make a, a situation reading. So we just some tokens and join to other things, give a new direction, uh, taking what we were useful to build that action. Jessica, Priscilla, can you do the question? 
I was writing here just to go in the line. We are almost at the end. I am not like to bring. I'm sorry of my uh, in a generalization, but in Julia's work and Leticia's work, they are discussing. Leticia mentioned the spaces that doesn't matter. Julie, in a certain way, uh, mentioned the immense experience in the city in a way that's less important. This seems less important regarding the system. And I thought it's so uh, interesting by her research, if the women are not in the system and stay at home, represent the excess of time that women take in unpaid work. I would like to ask to Tuli and Leticia, how do you think that this work helps to rethink a transformation, a reinvention of the city? Because here in this mobility group, we are discussing about planning models more than we discussed previously. So uh, to repeat the question, how your work that speaks about these groups that are less important helps? Are you rethinking in how the city transforms itself? So maybe these groups and those space become more important and how do you do that? Yeah, um, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me today with uh, everyone. And uh, I have a very uh, excellent opportunity to listen to the uh, research from different uh, locations with uh, different issues of the women in mobility, urban mobilities. First of all, I am not uh, an expert in the uh, urban planning, and also I'm not expert in the geography. I come from economics, and my research also come from the story of my research on women, uh, um, women employment. Uh, we started with the with the one research on the female labor force participation uh, in developing countries, and including Vietnam, and we. We found that we saw that the, the some, uh, ratio of women participate in labor force in Vietnam is uh, very good and uh, it is like uh, no difference with men. However, I am the Vietnamese woman. I know the gender gap is there. It's a uh, something high. Uh, something is a uh, high beer under the, the number. And uh, and then I start to do another research on the uh, vulnerable employment gender uh, in the gender views. And uh, I see that, ah, okay, so women, they participate in the labor force just like men. However, they, they tend to take the vulnerable job more than men because like they uh, they want to have like uh, flexible time for, for taking care of family of course in the because we do the uh, quantitative uh, research so we cannot say about the motivation or the some uh, some kind of like um, um, how to say the issue behind the number we only can say about the correlation between the men and women when uh, in uh, in the vulnerable zone is that's why I think that I should do something else to see the more uh, evidence of why women uh, participate in the labor market but they tend to choose the part time job why they tend to choose the not good job and and then I think should be the the barrier in traveling in uh, in transportation. And then I do this research, and I'm very good uh, and very I'm very happy to see the uh, the result that I see my hypothesis that uh, women have the barrier in transportation, and it seems to be that they trade up between the uh, traveling. Uh, outside the house for the take care of the unpaid or unpaid worker in-house. Of course, in here, I don't discuss that traveling are 
traveling outside more is better. No, I don't say that because maybe the traveling will face the physical and health uh, and mental health problems. And so in here, I only try to see the, the some evidence that the women, they choose, they tend to choose the uh, part-time job or vulnerable job because of some uh, barrier in uh, transportation. And so my research provides evidence for further research in the future for more um, uh, uh, evidence on like the why uh, the, the uh, impacts of uh, traveling and transportation on women health and also how impact to women uh, uh, employment. Um, so I think that's like we can rethinking in also the government, uh, the local government, the city government can um, have a, some solution because normally they think that like investigate investment on the transportation is will be bring the benefit to own equally, but I think that and now my research will tell that the the transportation is a not gender neutral neutral. It have the benefit differently on men and women because they have different uh, needs. For example, like for for men, they would tend to choose the good job even if far away from house. But the women, they choose, they prefer the uh, the job that near to house, and then they can take care of both the uh, work to earn the money and also take care of the how works. And I hope that uh, my answer addresses your question. And now let's go to Paula. Patricia. Patricia had problems with the internet. I'd like to thank you all. A very good discussion. It's a pleasure to be here with you, especially Paula. So we see each other tomorrow at the eight. We are invited to follow the tables and the team. And we have the keynote speaker, Faranak Kiranaktab. So it's going to be a very powerful day that starts with epistemology, raciality. And it was a wonderful day and closing very well the afternoon or the night, Priscilla. So thank you very much, Paula. Thank you for your invitation. I would like to say that the mobility issue needs the urbanism help and technology help and the interdisciplinary conversation that would be necessary to the follow up. Thank you for your invitation and let's go on with the seminar. Thank you. Sim, professora. Voltamos. Ah, obrigada, saí da cabine? Não, ainda estou na cabine. Espera só um pouquinho, professora. Eu vou tirar elas da cabine que elas conseguem responder para a senhora. <risos>